session of the Tacoma Park City Council. Will the clerk please call the roll? Oh, we don't need to do that. We're already in session. Sorry, right? <laughs> True. Yes. Um, we were, ju- we were, um, this has been a long night already. Um, the council convened at 6 p.m. in a closed session to um, talk with staff and our city attorney regarding um, potential lit- litigation. Um, the session was closed pursuant to annotated code of Maryland general provisions, article section 3-3057 and 3-3058. Um, we are now reconvening. Um, we will be in a closed session again um, next week at um, 6 p.m. Um, before we go any further, um, I just want to um, say that myself and I think Councilman Dabala will be a, a lit- little late joining us this evening because we were um, with uh, on on the phone with um, members of Adams Court and the family um, that lost um, their son uh, this past weekend, um, two-year-old Ezekiel, who fell from her window in Adams Court. Um, so I think if we could all just take a moment um, and have a moment of silence to remember um, Ezekiel and uh, keep his family in our thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, And I wanna um, say thank you um, to Grace Wiggins and our housing department for um, providing assistance to the family and the other members um, uh, who live in Adams Court and for bringing together uh, the service this evening and also to thank the Renters Alliance um, that has been working with the family um, and helping them to uh, raise funds for the um, the funeral services um, and creating a GoFundMe page for them. Um, Okay, Um, next week um, is our last uh, meeting before um, the election. So this city council um, has two more meetings together. (laughs) Um, And as this council, uh, and as I mentioned, we will be getting uh, the council meeting next week with a closed session to continue our conversation on potential litigation. We will then come back um, together and um, we'll begin with a recognition um, as we have been uh, since September. And then we'll have public comments. Our voting session um, next week is the second reading ordinance regarding principles of council compensation, uh, a resolution regarding personnel matters, which is one of our work sessions tonight a single reading ordinance authorizing a contract for tree removal, a resolution providing for appointment to the tree commission. And we will be having our stormwater presentation next week. We are, um, uh, we are lucky to have somebody from the county actually come uh, and talk to us about stormwater and permitting um, and um, some other things. And you know, this won't be um, the be end and end all conversation on stormwater, um, but uh, it will be a continuing um, conversation um, that we will have. And then we'll get an election update and we will then adjourn um, as for uh, until after the election. Um, so that is our upcoming meeting next week. Um, this week for our recognitions, uh, we have with us uh, the Old Town Business Association and the Crossroads um, Development Authority. Um, And I'm gonna read, I'll read both proclamations and then um, if Kaylee and Laura are with us, um, I'll see if they wanna say a few words, but um, first the Old Town Business Association, a proclamation for them. Whereas the Old Town Business Association raised over $40,000 in community donations to distribute to local businesses as micro grants for COVID-19 relief, And whereas the OTBA connected local businesses with available state, county, district, and city funding sources and provided business owners with application assistance. And whereas the OTBA updated businesses regarding uh, rapidly changing state and county closing and reopening regulations and assisted them with compliance. And whereas the OTBA distributed personal protective equipment and safety signage to businesses. And whereas the OTBA provided research and support to businesses as they modified operations and introduced new procedures like delivery, online sales, outdoor dining, gift cards, and more. And whereas the OTBA introduced three new outdoor community areas for safe enjoyment of takeout 
from local business, fitness classes, and neighbors meetups. And whereas the OTBA regularly updated the community on the status of the businesses and reminded the community to love your local by shopping and dining at area businesses. Now, therefore, I, Kate Stewart, Mayor of the City of Tacoma Park, Maryland, on behalf of the council, staff, and residents, do hereby express appreciation to Old Town, uh, Old, excuse me, Old Tacoma Business Association for its support to the Tacoma Business District during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then uh, for the uh, Tacoma Langley Crossroads Development Authority, whereas the Tacoma Langley Crossroads Development Authority connected the crossroads businesses with available state, county, and city relief resources, and the CDA provided personalized communication and application assistance to crossroads business owners, and whereas the CDA updated businesses concerning the rapidly changing state and county reopening regulations and assisted them with compliance and safety, Whereas the CDA purchased Crossroads branded community hand sanitizer stations for placement in heavily trafficked public areas of shopping centers. And whereas the CDA partnered with Tacoma Park City TV to create open for business videos highlighting Crossroads businesses and their reopening safety protocols in an effort to restore consumer confidence. Now, therefore, I, Kate Stewart, Mayor of the City of Tacoma Park, Maryland, on behalf of the council, staff, and residents, do hereby express appreciation to the Tacoma Langley Crossroads Development Authority for its support to the Crossroads businesses during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, and I just want to um, say thanks to um, Laura Barkley and Kelly Gunnett for uh, joining us this evening. I don't know if Laura or Kelly, you want to say a few words? Well, sure. Thank you very much for the proclamation. Um, I just wanted to use the opportunity to thank uh, Council for its leadership in designating funds for our small businesses and to um, recognize Samira Cook Gaines for the programs that she implemented that got money and resources into the hands of our small businesses during this very difficult time and um, use the opportunity to encourage people to continue to shop local. It's not over and our small businesses need us a whole lot right now. So thank you. I guess I'll I'll jump in. <laughs> uh, thank thank you so much, uh, Mayor Stewart. Um, I I will you know echo what Laura said in our appreciation for uh, the council and Samira's uh, amazing, quick moving and forward thinking uh, work during this emergency COVID situation. Um, one thing that's been very highlighted very clearly during this, you know, COVID emergency uh, situation that we're in is the importance of all levels of government working effectively. Um, and particularly when it's been kind of difficult to get that flow of resources from, you know, federal, state, or even county uh, resources to our businesses, our, at least we know that our city government has our back, is thinking of businesses, and is doing what they can to make sure that what resources we have at our control in the city of Tacoma Park will, can go towards uh, helping our businesses. So thank you all and have a great evening. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you for all you're doing for our business. I think it's really a testament to the great work of our staff and all of you that so many of our businesses have been able to stay open during this time and to even have a new business open um, in the Crossroads area um, is really um, is not only wonderful, but, you know, it tastes really good, too. <laughs> and they give us a lot of um, of hope that we will coming together. Um, we'll we'll get through this. So um, thank you for all you're doing. Um, Great. Uh, let's see, we have one other proclamation this evening. Um, it's National Arts and Humanities Month uh, is October. So whereas the nation's 120,000 nonprofit artists, arts organizations, 4,500 local art agencies, and state, county, and municipal governments have issued official proclamations on an annual basis designating October as National Arts and Humanities Month. 
whereas the arts and humanities embody much of the accumulated wisdom, intellect, and imagination of humankind and enrich the lives of Tacoma Park residents. And whereas the city of Tacoma Park actively supports the arts and humanities through the work of the city's arts and humanities division, including the funding and development of public art installations across Tacoma Park that are believed that are, excuse me, that are available for everyone to enjoy. And whereas the city's Tacoma Park Arts Cultural Series features a wide range of cultural events at the Tacoma Park Community Center and online, including art exhibitions, concerts, film screenings, dance and theater performances, children's events, poetry readings and lectures. And whereas arts and humanities help residents of Tacoma Park and diverse communities across the United States explore their history and culture. And whereas the arts and humanities strengthen the fabric of Tacoma Park's community while supporting local artists, stimulating local businesses and promoting tourism. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Kate Stewart, Mayor of the City of Tacoma Park, Maryland, on behalf of the City Council, staff, and residents, do hereby recognize October 2020 as Arts and Humanities Month in the City of Tacoma Park and call upon our community, community to celebrate and promote arts and culture locally across and across the nation. So thank you for that. Um, okay. Um, so I next we'll have public comments on voting items and i don't believe anyone um registered just checking with the city clerk that um, we did not have anyone register for public comments on voting items but we did have one general public comment and i believe julie is with us if we want to do we lose our city clerk no you have okay. lost. <laughs> I got lost, but uh, okay. so uh, uh, Julie Bodie is in the meeting now. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm requesting the council to lift its recent ban on recruitment from outside Tacoma Park and to allow the Nuclear Free Committee to accept new members from the District of Columbia and Prince George's County. Our public programs, especially our memorial to AC Bird, have alerted us to the interest and talent um, present in our in our broader community, both on the stage and uh, in the audience. Our goodwill in following the direction, the directives of the council, uh, make us worthy of its trust. And and we are asking, I am asking, um, your attention to permit recruitment as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, and I believe those were all the public comments this evening. Am I correct? Yes, that's correct. Great. Now we will go to um, council comments. Okay, Councilman Caustic. Thank you. Um, just two quick things. Um, last week I mentioned that WMATA is um, having their budget hearings related to service cuts in response to reduced revenues uh, from COVID. And I just wanted to um, remind my fellow council members that I had drafted a letter um, and circulated it earlier today for anyone who would like to sign on to it, um, just urging WMATA to keep in mind um, residents who need um, bus and metro rail service to access jobs and don't have um, other forms of transportation. Um, I think in reviewing some of the materials, it looks like the the cuts um, that they're proposing um, will be um, similar to what has been happening since earlier in the pandemic. And I really appreciate the um, the look into this that uh, city staff did. Thank you for, for taking a look at that. Um, and it, it certainly won't be good, but I think the considering how... Um, how difficult of a position public transit is in right now. I do think um, that I, it's understandable that cuts are need, need to be made. And so um, the letter that I drafted focuses primarily on um, urging WMATA to make those cuts in a concerted way and keep in mind that um, people need to be able to access uh, bus and Metro rail as much as possible. And then I also wanted to let uh, members of the public and the council know 
that uh, Maryland DOT is having a meeting tomorrow night for Montgomery County focused on their consolidated transportation plan, which is their plan for the next five years. Uh, that's at seven o'clock. It's a virtual meeting and uh, people need to register to attend, but I believe you can register up until the meeting starts. And that's an opportunity to learn a little more about what plans they have coming up um, for the future years. Uh, and that is all I have for tonight. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Councilmember Smith. Uh, first, you know, I, last week we had a representative from Comcast before us uh, to talk about their Internet Essentials Partnership Program. Disappointing that uh, that is not once again before us uh, as a council for us to consider uh, buying licenses, free internet for our most vulnerable uh, residents. So I do hope uh, that maybe our last council meeting that council will be able to um, at least vote on whether or not uh, the city should invest in uh, internet services for our residents. Uh, I, it's, it's a the tragedy that once again we had a a, a child um, fall from a window. I am calling on my colleagues to uh, allocate money for window guards. They're only twenty five dollars. Uh, we can do an initial bulk buy, and in the future we could require it. Uh, window guards uh, for our apartment landlords um, in our code. I think this is uh, something that we need to do immediately. Uh, this is an easy fix. It's done in New York City. I don't see why uh, we should not do it here in Tacoma Park. Uh, if anyone has a computer to donate, uh, please contact me. I'm working with a nonprofit in Rockville that will refurbish the computer and we can get it to some of the needy families here in the city. Uh, I talked about a couple weeks ago that um, there will be flu shots and COVID testing in Tacoma Park. So that is happening this Sunday uh, at 76 Carroll Avenue, Washington Adventist Hospital campus starting at 11 a.m is 100% free. Uh, there are no appointments required, no insurance required, no medical order, no money will be changing hands. So if you need a flu shot, if you uh, need COVID-19 testing, please come out uh, and we will take care of you. This is really important. I have been asked uh, by residents for flu shots. So, uh, here it is. And I want to thank Adventist Healthcare, Washington Adventist University, Giant, the Latino Health Initiative, Mary Center, Casa Identity, and a no number of other organizations that have stepped up and are helping with um, this very critical uh, testing and, and flu shot program for our community. Um, so please come out. Uh, I, I also mentioned the Bibliotech program. Please um, support this. I'll, I'll provide more information on the listservs and my social media uh, content. It's basically a library on a tablet uh, since um, some of my colleagues want to move forward with uh, the uh, expensive library project. Our library will be closed, but that does not mean that people should not be able to continue to access uh, books. Uh, and finally, um, November uh, after the election through January is gonna be a very difficult time in this country. Um, there will not be money for people, those people in social services, those people getting unemployment. There is a possibility that that is going to be reduced drastically because Congress cannot figure out another um, COVID-19 uh, CARES package. So uh, just please um, take care of your neighbors, uh, look out for one another. Um, this is going to be unprecedented, even if uh, the occupants and 
White House changes. He cannot make any uh, requests uh, before Congress until he's sworn in in January. So please, please uh, look out for one another. It's going to be really tough. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Councilmember Smith, if you have a specific recommendation you'd like to bring before the council next week, if you have a, a, a dollar amount regarding the Wi-Fi or more specifics, I'm happy to put it on the agenda. I was so just let me know what specifics you want and we can ask you can ask the city attorney to draw up a resolution if it's a resolution that um, is needed. Um, I'll do that. Thank you. Um, if I may ask Councilmember Smith to repeat the uh, the date, time, and location for the free flu shots. Thank you, Councilmember Siemens. And I do have extra posters if anybody wants any uh, for your own wards. It will be uh, October 18th, that is a Sunday, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at 7600 Carroll Avenue. So sure, that's 7600 Carroll Avenue. Thank eight. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Member Kovar. Thank you. Uh, just a few quick things. Um, I did have the opportunity over the weekend, uh, Mayor Stewart was there also to participate in the Indigenous Peoples uh, Celebration, Indigenous Peoples Day celebration, and it was held over in uh, Sligo. Um, if another of my colleagues was there, and I'm forgetting, I apologize. There were about 30 people there, and um, Gabby Tayek, Gabrielle Tayek from uh, City Resident was the one who organized it, and it was a, a both a celebration and somewhat solemn as well, uh, and we essentially communed with the waters on Sligo Creek, but it was a, it was a great event. I was glad to be able to be there. I also do want to... Uh, thank uh, the mayor for the recognitions of uh, OTBA and CDA. Both of those business groups have done a lot for the community and the small businesses in the community over the years, of course, but in particular um, in, in COVID, they played an important role in helping bolster uh, our local businesses and helping them to, to stay in business. Um, one question just connected to the election and I defer to others on whether we need this, but several people mentioned this, um, where the two drop boxes are at the community center. It's very clear which is which in the signage leading up to it until you get right to the end. The signage only references the local one and not the, the, the state one that includes the presidential. And I don't know whether um, in what we get from Montgomery County Board of Elections, there's additional signage, but several people mentioned that they weren't sure until they got to the very end of the of following the signs that both were there. So that's something just for us to think about. And then um, lastly, I just want to mention I'm doing another virtual community meeting slash office hours on Monday the 19th at 7 p.m. I've sent the information out and we'll do so again as, as the day gets closer. Encourage any Ward 1 people who are interested to, to join in. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, sorry, I'm trying to eat my dinner too. Um, Councilwoman Searcy. Hello, um, just a couple of quick things. Um, I want to echo Councilmember Kovar in um, thanking um, OTBA and the CDA for all of the hard work that they've been doing um, during the course of, of COVID, not only responding to um, the needs of um, businesses, but and um, also bringing in um, new businesses and, and from the perspective of the CDA, um, but also being on the ground um, to help us to understand what some of the potential lasting impacts of COVID may have on our business community. Um, the CDA is already starting to see more vacancies than it, it ever has. Um, and so, you know, it creates um, a, a great way for us to work in partnership with our business associations to um, start not just thinking from the perspective of um, meeting the needs of businesses right now, um, but also starting to anticipate um, and coming up with creative ways to fill some vacancies that, that may be a, a real um, challenge for us in the future. So I just want to thank um, them both again for all of the hard work that they've put in as well as um, 
our economic development manager, um, Samira Cook Gaines, for all of her hard work. Um, also want to thank Small Things Matter um, for recent food delivery um, to Hampshire Towers. Um, the residents there really appreciate um, all of the um, services that Small Things Matter has been providing. So I just want to, again, thank Roxanne and her team for, for coming out. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, um, the purple line looks like, according to, t to Twitter and lots of press release, um, that uh, we might be kicking up construction again. So um, we'll, we'll definitely continue to uh, move forward. Um, I know that um, the mayor, myself, and, and some others um, are trying to work with um, Councilmember Glass to schedule a walkthrough to include the crossroads area, and we're, we're working on scheduling that. But um, just so that people are aware, there has been um, a number of notifications that um, the state is starting to um, resume um, its contracting with some of the co subcontractors from the, the previous concessionaire um, and starting to do construction again. So we'll see how all of that shakes out. So, um, but that's all I have. Thank you all so much. Thank you, um, Councilman Damala. Yes, thank you. Uh, just a couple of things quickly. Um, pe other people have covered some of the things I was going to talk about. Um, tomorrow night, uh, for those of you who live on Auburn Avenue, there'll be uh, first a, a, a socially distant meet, uh, meet your neighbor from 4.30 to 5.30 tomorrow night. And then at 7, there will be a block meeting to talk about issues related to the block. Um, I will also be... Uh, I was on Elm Avenue last weekend, and I'll be on Lincoln this Saturday afternoon and um, over in Long Branch, Sligo, uh, in, on Sunday afternoon to hear from residents about issues that you only have. I also um, wanted to let you all know that I thought the MML conference was, was, uh, was very useful, and I um, was pleased to see the Sustainable Maryland Award awards including Tacoma Park last Friday morning and that's it for me thank you great um thank you uh, I want to add my thanks to um Gabby Tayak for helping put together the Indigenous Peoples Day and holding the um gathering of the water ceremony and I want to do a huge thank out to, uh, thank you to um Donna Wright on our staff um who helped us get the permit um, and made sure we were all socially distanced and as well as thanking the um, city TV um, for doing that. So thank you to everyone. Um, I want to join in um, Councilman DeBala and saying M we, about the MML conference and to thank the deputy city manager uh, for joining me on a panel on racial equity um, at the conference. Um, and just um, she did a great job uh, talking about the work that we're doing in the city. So I wanted to Thank her for that. I think it was a really good panel. Um, in addition, this week, I know we're uh, continuing to work on the task force um, for imagining public safety. And I want to um, thank um, a, a couple who sent us, uh, myself, the city manager and the chief, an email regarding um, an incident that took place um, and um, it just highlighted the need for mental health services in our community. Um, and also um, the work that our officers are doing now. And I just, I know Officer Cindy Williams um, had, a, you know, had a very busy weekend. And I just want to thank her for her service to our community um, in this one instance where she was really able to help um, um, a member of our community who was in distress, um, as well as providing um, assistance to others. So I just want to thank Officer Williams for all her work. Um, and I think that, yeah, that's it for me. Um, city manager comments. Thanks. I'm trying to do my phone thing because uh, my internet is out. So <laughs> a little bit uh, awkward today. A number of things. Um, today and every Wednesday, there will be uh, COVID-19 testing on Greenwood Avenue behind Sligo Adventist Church, so close to Carroll Avenue. It's either drive-through or walk-up, and it's free, and 
There's no government ID or insurance required. I did it today. It was it went well. So I urge people to uh, take advantage of that free opportunity. Um, I really want to uh, do a shout out to the folks that put this together, which included um, the uh, Washington Adventist University, Sligo Adventist Church, Montgomery County, and the city. Um, and I particularly like to note that Jessica Clark has been really helpful in getting these, um, they're not called pop-ups, but essentially these uh, testing dates that, um, set up. Other information, if you haven't registered for the census, tomorrow is the very last day that they are um, taking information. Um, it's easy to be counted. You go to my2020census.gov or you call 844-330-2020. It really is important. Um, and it, the, tomorrow's the last day, so please take advantage of that. Uh, want to follow up a moment on our ballot drop boxes. We'll continue to make sure that our signage gets people there, but we at the community center, we have two ballot drop boxes, one for the Montgomery County presidential ballots and one for the city of Tacoma Park ballots. Once they arrive in people's mailboxes, um, then we will unlock uh, the city box, which is the orange one. Uh, for people to use as a drop box. There's also a city one at the rec center, but there's not a county one at the rec center. Um, just wanted to note that um, there have been some questions about, you know, the, the silver box. It is a, it is a county box. And once you drop your um, presidential ballot in there, you can go online to um, check ballot status, um, at, at the uh, voter search, um, access off of the Maryland elections uh, website to see if the Board of Election has received your completed ballot. It takes a little bit for them to scan it in. So it took, it took for me a week, but I think they're moving quick, more quickly now. Um, I want to shout out my kudos to our finance director, Susan Chung. She again has a, been awarded the Government Finance Officer Association's Award of Financial Reporting Achievement for her work on the city's CAFR, the Comprehensive, um, Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Um, that CAFR was received, did receive the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. This is the 14th straight year that we have won this award because we have um, excellent financial management in the city and very pleased to have Ms. Chung's careful oversight so that we continue that excellence. We're working on the on the next CAFR right now. It it has to be submitted to the state on, on uh, Halloween. So we're, we're moving that along and then the audit uh, and, and the pension actuarial report will be um, provided in November to the council. I've included in my city manager comments um, a link to information on window safety with the with the young boy falling from a window. Um, there's a number of things that we all can do to keep windows um, safe in our homes. And just a reminder that screens do not keep people inside windows. Screens are not enough. Uh, so I do have a link to the National Safety Council's information on window safety. And as Council Member Smith mentioned, there are window guards, but we do have to make sure that they meet code and that there's certain activities that in that there's some places where they may not be the right answer. Uh, so we are um, have a lot of attention to making sure that we have um, the right equipment for the windows and we want to work with uh, landlords across the city to make sure that windows are safe. So we're looking forward to helping out in every way possible. We did start doing that just before we went into remote uh, with the pandemic and so we're picking that back up again uh, and we recognize how hard it is to, um, um, to get everything done but this is how important this is. I want to note that um, as the mayor mentioned both our police and housing staff have been affected um, by working with the family and the tenants um, at Adams Court, and it's very hard on them. I really commend them for their professionalism and their caring, and our hearts go out to the family and the tenants and the, and the property owner at this time. I just wanted to note, um, 
At times, people ask how many Public Information Act requests we have outstanding. Uh, we have three at the time. And um, so I've included those on my uh, city manager comments. Ones that are open are ones from the Marshall Project uh, regarding the police canine program, one from a woman named Erica Meyer regarding the Tacoma Overlook suicide, and a request from Jay Driscoll regarding certain parking restrictions in Ward 5. And I'd like to end today by saying, yay, we have a new urban forest manager. Uh, some of you may have seen him around. It's Marty Fry. He's been working um, with Pitchford Associates, which has uh, been a contractor for us when we've needed additional um, urban forest management arborist assistance. But he's now working for the city of Tacoma Park. And it's really happy about that. Um, I know our public works department is really happy about having him on board. Um, just wanted to note that before he worked with uh, Pitchford Associates, he worked with Casey Trees in Washington, and he grew up in Tacoma, DC. So he knows our community really well. Uh, he has a BA in environmental science from the University of Vermont. So we welcome Marty and um, I have a picture of him with his mask on, but uh, get a sense of what he looks like uh, from my city manager comments. I think that's all for me. If there's any questions. I think Councilman Costick has a question. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much for the update on the PIA requests. Um, I wanted to ask, it, it seems like that one has been lingering for a while and is, has been around since earlier this year. What is being done or can be done to move that along? I know there was some discussion earlier about maybe working with the person who requested it to narrow the scope of it. Um, what are, are you moving along with that and, and can that be resolved soon? I'm not sure. I'll have to have the city clerk respond to you on that. Thank you. Um, perhaps we can get something back to you uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Great. All right. Um, we have uh, the second reading ordinance. Author uh, we'll move into our voting session. The first item is the second reading or ordinance authorizing FY21 budget amendment number two. Um, there are no changes from last week. Um, so um, I can answer any questions, but it's it's the same information as last week. Okay. I think we've lost council member Siemens to space, um, but I'm not seeing any. Uh... Actually, Mayor, if I, if I might, I just, I do want to um, recap one aspect of this. And there's, um, as we do these budget amendments, uh, sometimes it affects our bottom line and, and what's in our reserve. And um, at this point, we are increasing our reserve with the actions uh, that are reflected in these budget amendments. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, it's supposed to be a halo. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, okay, um, well, since this is a budget amendment, um, let's see. Um, I, Council Member Smith, are, are you ready, prepared this week? To, do you know how much money you wanted to uh, propose for Wi-Fi service or should we wait till next week? Uh, I would propose $15,000. Fifteen thousand uh, dollars. All right. Um, why don't you hold that for a second? We'll ask somebody to move that. If you wanted to, would someone like to move the second reading ordinance authorizing the FY twenty one budget amendment number two? I'll move it. I got Council Member Siemens, Councilwoman Searcy. Uh, do we have any amendments to the budget amendment? Were you suggesting that Council Member Smith should put that in now? Well, I was going to ask if it was because it is a budget amendment and then that way it would secure some funding for it. Council Member Smith, did you want to move an, an amendment? Yes, uh, I will move the amendment for $15,000 uh, to pay for the Comcast Internet Essentials Partnership Program. I will second that amendment. I think the, it, 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 I'm sorry. Could I could I just interrupt for a moment, mm -hmm. um, Councilmember Smith? Would it be okay if you were not so specific about the provider in case we were able to um, get RCN or Verizon for some assistance as well? Yes, I uh, I will change my amendment. Mm -hmm. I will uh, move uh, a motion. I would like to make a motion to provide fifteen thousand dollars 
for internet services, at least one year's worth of internet services for Tacoma Park residents. And, and I will uh, second the changed amendment. Thank you. All right, a friendly change. Um, it, I'm just going to ask before I ask for a conversation, anything from the city manager in, in terms of other, anything else you would need for that amendment to go into the, since this is the second reading? I, I think we can handle it. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. Um, any discussion on the amendment? Oh. All right. Yeah, go ahead, Councilman Searcy. Oh, sorry. Um, so based on some quick, math um i just want to confirm it looks like at, at if we're assuming the rate that we heard from compact comcast in terms of ten dollars a month and we're talking about a year and at fifteen thousand, it looks like it may be about 125 households so is that about where we would want to be um in terms of the number of households served Councilmember Sears. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I would just say that uh, that would. This is a starting point. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't have data on the demand, and in my conversations with Comcast, they don't have that data either. They have it on a, a national level, maybe on a state level, but not on a micro Tacoma Park level. Uh, if we exceed the demand, uh, I think that you know it would be appropriate if we you know, make another budget amendment, but I would like to start with this and see, you know, how, what the response is. Yeah, I, I like that approach um, and I support this, this amendment. Um, Council Member Smith, happy to work with you um, on a, maybe perhaps a resolution once we kind of hear from the city attorney that we may be able to add some, some language that would hold um, future councils to revisit this initiative um, to make sure that we, we keep this at the forefront of everyone's mind, especially as we um, perhaps will get into the next budget round. So um, definitely think this is a great idea um, and a great start. So thank you for proposing it. Thank you, and I'd like to work with you. Yes, and I, I also thank you, and uh, I think this is very important. Um, I think it's going to be a uh, challenge uh, as a startup on such a short, uh, short thread here. We're just uh, getting started, and there's a lot of uh, kind of policy issues that need to be resolved. But I really appreciate your bringing that forward and, and getting it in this budget amendment tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Seamus. Great. So, can the clerk call the roll on the amendment? Yes, Councilmember Kovar. Aye. Councilmember Dabala? Yes. Councilmember Kostic? Yes. Councilmember Siemens? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Searcy? Aye. Mayor Stewart? Yep. All right. Any other conversations on the budget amendment? Uh, budget, yeah, the budget amendment number two. The <laughs> All right. Seeing none, will the clerk call the roll? Councilmember Kovar? Aye. Councilmember Dabala? Aye. Councilmember Kostic? Aye. Councilmember Siemens? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Searcy? Aye. Mayor Stewart? Yep. All right. Um, moving on then to our next voting item, the first reading ordinance revising principles of council compensation. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Councilwoman Dabala. Yes, thank you. So a couple of weeks ago, we discussed um, the principles of, of compensation that the task force put forward last spring. Um, so refresher, we, uh, there was a task force on council compensation. There is one every several years and they recommended a number of, of fairly dramatic changes. And one of them was to uh, update the- Let me tell you how everybody on here um, I right. think we can, somebody. That sounded like Samira. <laughs> nope, Anyhow. she's muted. I don't know who it was, but she, Samira's muted, so. Okay, so to continue, to, to just continue with the, with the very brief refresher, because it's been a while. So um, the task force recommended that the 2003 
principles for council compensation be updated and um, they pointed to a number of reasons which are outlined in the in the in the resolution why we oh, excuse me ordinance why we would want to do that and we talked about that a couple of weeks ago um, so what you have in front of you is uh, the, something similar to Are we are we going to bring this up on the screen? Do you think, or are we just? Am I going to just read the the changes? So oh, to, I thought you were going to do that. Story. I can do that. I can bring it up. Sorry, I yeah. thought. Um. So the the posted version is the version from last week. The version that was sent around and that we are posting now recognizes the changes that um, a couple of council members had and that the. Um, city attorney had, and I'll just okay. walk through them if I can, if you'd like. But um, procedurally, are there general questions before we go through the specific edits? And before we go through the specific edits, um, do we need to move the move the ordinance as a? No, you can go, you can walk through the. You can. We haven't moved yet. If you want to. I, I think the the changes were were fairly minor. So if you want to just like walk through the changes, okay, from the ones that were posted yeah, yeah. on the website, um, and then we can and move as a as amended as you're discussing it. So could I ask a general question before we do the run through, or would you rather have me ask it afterwards? I think I let's go through these because it might answer your question. All right. That I'm clairvoyant, but we have talked about this, so I. I think I might know what you want to bring up. So um, the the first the first change is in the second whereas, and it's a couple of adjustments from the city attorney. Um, there are several changes changing the committee to task force because that's how it was officially named. You go down to the the sixth and seventh whereas is were inadvertently left out. They were in there before, and they are the the um, rationale that the task force gave us for wanting to change the principles from 2003. And it amounts, uh, it, it essentially, um, the old principles talked about part-time employment. They talked about uh, the pay being the status, not the fact that we're that that uh, council members are elected. Uh, they talked about the size of Tel Tacoma Park and and some other things that the task force recommended as not being relevant. Um, so that that brings us down then to um, the chapter 204 periodic view of council compensation so this is this is actually what we are adopting is a an amendment to this chapter of the code so the so the changes to a are are in my view not substantive um, they they describe that we would at least every four years do this review, uh, which was a recommendation from the task force um, not to be locked into every four years. And then it deletes the old ones. Excuse me, and Council Member Tabal, would it be possible, Mayor Stewart, to make it a little bit bigger? I'm honestly having a hard time just seeing the text. And if that's impossible, I'll. There you go. I'll survive. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, I'm actually not looking at it. I'm looking at my screen, which is bigger. Well, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. So I didn't notice. Yeah. So what? So um. So I was saying we're we're uh, we're now down to B. The purpose of the com. These are the new principles as recommended by the commit uh, by the task force, and the city attorney, um, had suggested a rewording of B. Um, and I uh, asked that we put it back to um, what what the task force recommended in the first place, um, so so we can uh, 
let me run through the rest of them. This, and if people want to come back to this uh, B and discuss it, we can, because um, it was it was a an area that someone raised last time as wanting to to have a little more definition there. Um, so on number two. Uh, again, going back to, that's a, a, a grammatical change. Um, financial condition and fiscal capacity and not or. Um, the service and stewardship uh, of the mayor and council members. Um, number three is set, uh, said, um, I'm a little confused because this is um, actually not what I thought I said changed. Um, okay, so three is, uh, again, the words of the task force themselves. Um, four, is, four is just a, gra a grammatic change. Five is, um, adding a, a couple of words and in C, it, it's um, adding a couple words. So um, the two substantive changes, if you will, um, or not sub not changes, are B, the beginning B, and then three. If anyone has a comment on either of those. I have a question about the the draft because I was I'm looking at it on the version that was posted is that not the most recent version I think it's a little different than what is being shown here yeah Councilman Dabala had some changes that she asked the oh, okay. city hearing to make and that's that's what she's running through here I see okay so the 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 version that was posted was the version from the last time we talked the city attorney made some edits and then I had some suggestions about that and this is the result of it. Um, so this reflects a couple of other council members, minor comments, the city attorney's comments and my comments on the draft that was posted. If that makes any, I'm, I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear. Councilman Kostick, you still look confused. Do we need to go? No, no, I think I got it. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm a little confused about the the one on, on B and and you you mentioned on B that the you went back to what the the task force recommended and which which one was what the task force recommended to help ensure that all residents have a fair chance to run for city elective office or was it what's deleted in the comments here? Yes, the the what the. What the task force suggested was a fairer chance to run for city oh, like office. Our discussion, I think it may have been Council Member Smith, saying, could we have something more specific about equity? And um, now I'm not seeing the words that. It says, which promote a more equitable opportunity for residents to run for elected, um, I think it's office. Yeah, elected office. Yeah, on, on my screen, it, it the screen is shaped so that that sentence is actually just above where you can see. There it is, okay. Is there a reason why you recommended going back to the earlier version? Because I, I felt that it was important to be true to the language that the group had um, had worked uh, to come up with and had discussed fairly completely and thoroughly at the time. Yeah, I, I, I personally like equitable here rather than fairer, but I, I mean, let's let's continue talking before we get into nitty gritties. <laughs> right, and 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 uh, Mayor, would you mind moving it just a little bit down so that we can see both? versions, I guess I'm end up. That? No, that's not it. Well, never mind. I just emailed it to everyone too. 
Is it? Is it better if I reduce it a bit? So why don't we start at the top and go through and we can um, discuss the, uh, I think that what, what has changed Councilman Caustic and the rest of the council is what is um, redlined here. So in the resolution, um, basically we're just adding in line 21 and here and after a couple of changing it to task force rather than committee and the two whereas clauses that are redlined here were added because they were inadvertently omitted. Right. Anyone have any concerns or changes or about moving forward on that? All right, seeing none then we'll continue down. Um, and so, yeah, so as I said, the, the, the two substantive places are this new B. Yeah. Where, so, yeah. Where we were just talking about it. Um, right. But just before that, I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Sorry, Councilman Ball. So then right. the other change, just to be clear, that we are looking at is in line 23 and 24 that says at least every four years, as Councilman Dabala said before. So that's there. And then the thing to focus on is B. Mm -hmm. So what the, what the task force, excuse me, came up with was to help ensure that all residents have a fair chance to run for city elective office. When we looked at this before, um, there was a request to um, make the language, um, have the language be a bit different. And so what the city attorney had put in was which promote a more equitable uh, incentive and opportunity for residents to run for elected office. We can pick one or the other of those or come up with something new tonight. Um, the original of what the task force um, suggested is what is now in I don't know if it's a reddish brown color that shows up on your computer, but that's what the color is on mine. And what is in the comment as deleted is the city attorney's attempt to um, take what we talked about in our work session and add it. Um, and then the, only, the other change is in number three. And this is one that was added back in, but was one that we had talked about taking out um, at our last meeting. Um, and so, again, I think Councilwoman Dabala um, had requested to put it back in so that we could see what the um, the task force had recommended um, there. And then everything else is, I th think, should just follow along with a couple of changing things to is to a shall. So I think the two big things for us to focus on, unless someone has seen something else, is one, under the principles of compensation, um, do people have a preference for which language is used there? I would say that I prefer the deleted phrase. I mean, I don't understand what fair chance to rent for city elective office means. Mm -hmm. I think I agree with council member. Smith on that. Other people? Me too. You too, okay. Any, all right, how would I do it this way? Anyone object to you having the deleted language put back in? Speak now. All right, so then we will make that change. Um, so that means I'm rejecting the deletion and rejecting that, okay. And then the next one is um, putting back in, in recognition of the high quality community centered services rendered by the city park city council. We had discussed before that this seemed weird for us to say we were high quality <laughs> um, in the resolution. Um, I think it was council member Kovar who had noted that before. Um, I think it's also is, I mean, I appreciate that they, the task force said that about us. Um, and, um, but I, I, I do agree, it seems 
a bit odd in to put it in the principles of compensation. Yeah, yeah. And I can I just say something? I yeah. thought that when I when I asked for the language to be changed, that I had dropped high quality. So oh, okay. I maybe I didn't actually type that, and I meant to, or doesn't matter that my intention was to not have high quality in there, but to no. leave the sense of community centered service rather than for the services performed by the mayor and council members, because the point I thought from the task force was that the services in Tacoma by the Tacoma Park City Council are uniquely community centered and not generically what every other city city council does. And I believe we had actually suggested some verbiage uh, last time in place of this, which was in recognition of something like the complex community oriented service. Okay, that works. I, I'm afraid I did, didn't have that written down. Anyone else? Community, community oriented is good also. All right, well, let's not wordsmith <laughs> That's exactly what we're doing. I know, well, we had a work session on it. I thought we were, yeah. Um, okay, so it reads now, recognition of the complex community-oriented services rendered by the Tacoma Park City Council. Um, And we can move it like this. I'm still, I probably will, I still feel like it's weird. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, in recognition of the complex community oriented. I mean, to say community oriented services sounds like we're doing something other than setting policy, which is what we do. I mean, we do do ser other services, but I feel like our main job as a city, as the city council is to set policy and to talk about complex community oriented services, I think feels to me that we're doing something other than setting policy. So, but I don't know how other folks feel. So unless there's other small wording changes, um, I'll ask if somebody wants to move this and then we can amend it. I, I would just say that, you know, um, rather than complex community oriented service, I would feel more comfortable if we said something about the full uh, nature of the services rendered by the Tacoma Park City Council. I mean, you know, okay. Tacoma Park is is um, the service that we offer, are, you know, almost identical to a much bigger city like uh, Baltimore or um, the District of Columbia. So, I mean, because of that, I think is what adds to this complexity the full service nature of the services that are offered by the city. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you, Councilmember Smith, but the way this is worded now, it sounds like it says rendered by the, the Cone Park City Council. So it sounds like we're rendering services. That's my point that we shouldn't, we don't render services. Right. All right. So I think we're in agreement. Yeah. Yeah. We manage somebody's, you know, the rendering of services. Right. It would be, it would be the complex community oriented policy decisions. Right, but do we need to specify that or just? But I think Councilmember Smith's point is well taken that we're, it is unique uh, to a city of our size. And so we would like to say something that it is, it is in fact. What if we were to say, what if we were to say in recognition of the complex community oriented nature of the work of the Tacoma Park City Council. So we get rid of services, which That's good. may seem of up nature of the work. Uh, up, uh, performed by or whatever. Does that get called? I, th I think I think that that works. Be the word services is is a problematic for lots for a number of people. Wordsmithing is a good thing. <laughs> cool. 
Mm. I'm sorry I wasn't able to get this worked out before we got to it, got to tonight. Mm -hmm. I didn't, um, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> All right, so in recognition of the complex community-oriented nature of the work performed by the city, the Tacoma Park City Council, the city should strive to maintain compensation. Okay, that works. All right, um, would someone like to move it? Councilman Dabala moved, do I have a second? Council Member Kovar, you need to take a second. Any um, changes or other things? I just have a general question, if, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure who can answer it, but um, as I recall earlier in the year when we were looking at a, <clears throat> a different version of this, there was some discussion then, and we decided not to do that to change the actual pay. And I think everybody agreed that during the pandemic wasn't the time to do that. And I also understand that whenever we do potentially make a change, if we were to do that, it really couldn't take effect until after um, a subsequent election, if I remember correctly or understand correctly. So whatever we do here, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this, but we can't actually uh, put in place a change for another couple of years. Is that a is that a fair statement in terms of the actual pay? At least is that a fair statement? A, a, a sitting city council cannot change its own pay. Yes. Okay. So it would be the next council would take could take this up to impact the pay. A of after that. And and if the point is to provide a more equity, a more equitable incentive, that makes sense that, that we would set the policy direction here. And then in the next budget cycle or the one after that, consider the financial part of it. For yeah, the, I so think that, it, also, it also works because when that following election takes place, everybody running will know if we've adjusted the pay and so that and provided we do it far enough in advance of the election, uh, that will have the effect of uh, ensuring that potential candidates understand what the revised pay and compensation would be. So I think timing wise that works out. Yeah, that, that's what I was about to say. Okay, um, any other comments or anything? All right, um, well, it's been moved. No other amendments or comments. Just to know that this is the first reading. We have a second reading next week. So if folks want to sit on the complex community-oriented nature of our work and <laughs> suggest other changes, we have time um, in our second reading. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Kovar? Aye. Councilmember Dabala? Aye. Councilmember Kostic? Yes. Councilmember Siemens? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Council Member Searcy? Aye. Mayor Stewart? Yes. All right. Um, that's that one. The next item we have is a resolution regarding public art expenditures. And I'll take it. OK. So I wanted to follow up on um, the uh, presentation about the public arts funding and the idea about um, expanding our work through a uh, public artworks plan with public works and, and others. Um, so it's called the public artworks plan and it also includes an approach to maintenance of installed public art. Brendan Smith had uh, presented this plan. Um, it was something that uh, was to identify how the $49,000 in public art funds uh, for this year could be uh, spent um, and that discussion it was a presentation about the idea of poetry and sidewalks, uh, some work with bus stops, um, some, um, some you know, attractive bike racks, that kind of thing. There was also a discussion about uh, potentially um, allocating $9,900 for the refurbishment of the um, mural in, at B.Y. Morrison Park. Um, there was, uh, hesitation about expending 
those funds for that purpose. So staff uh, went back, um, identified kind of a plan for how we would um, best uh, spend work for these various other public artworks projects um, that a, um, and a spreadsheet was presented as part of this package that identified sidewalk stamps with poetry, uh, which does involve a good amount of um, early work because it's <laughs> rooting poetry, poets to come up with that and, and identifying where that goes. Um, similarly, design of bike racks and public art vinyl designs for bus shelters and potentially some interesting bus shelter um, actual designs. The uh, resolution that is before you is to um, kind of release the hold on those public arts funds because when the uh, $49,000 was um, transferred over in the first budget amendment, an additional um, item was added that public arts funds will not be expended without council discussion and direction, which has then um, was taken place. Um, so what's before you then is authorization for city staff to move forward on this kind of multi-year approach of um, using public arts funds for these various public works projects. One of the things that we uh, did do was to remove the a proposal to pay $9,900 for the restoration of the damaged mural in BY Morrison Park. It currently has graffiti and mold on it. Um, it's on panels, so it can be removed. In order to have it uh, fixed, you would need to remove it to, to restore it. Um, alternatively, um, if it's not to be restored through our funds, um, then the artist would like to have it back. And uh, so this um, resolution authorizes the city staff to move forward with the public arts works proposal and authorizes the removal of the mural at BY Morrison Park and returning it to the artist. Um, so I turn that over to you at this point. So if you're in the comments and uh, how you'd like to move forward with this resolution. Yeah. Thank you very much and, and thank you for um, the staff and the committee for um, considering uh, the input they got when we uh, they did their presentation um, and going back and thinking about um, and preparing for us as Councilman Costick had requested more details on their budget. Um, does may, anyone I have move, may I move the resolution? May, oh, sure, you met Council Member Siemens moved. Do I have a second? Councilman Costick second. Any questions or amendments we want to consider? Council McCover? Yes, thank you. Um, I mentioned this to uh, a few of uh, my colleagues and, and the staff. Um, when we discussed this, I believe it was two weeks ago or maybe three weeks ago on the 23rd, and um, there, there were comments from several of my colleagues about the mural. Um, I feel a little bit like we, um, we missed or skipped over a step because while there were comments about the depictions of black people in, in, the, in the mural, and, and I think those are serious points to, to consider um, we didn't have a general discussion about that, and, and now we've jumped to the, well, we've gotten to the situation where the plan is to not go forward with the restoration. And if a majority of the council thinks that, I understand that, but I, but I, I feel like we didn't really have the uh, kind of a, a community discussion or a, a huge amount of input from the community I've heard from some people since then, but um, I don't know if it's possible to go forward with all the rest of this and put that decision on hold while we assess uh, where the broader community is on it for a while, or I'd just be interested in hearing what other people have to say about that. Would anyone else like to? Provide comment on what? Uh, 
if I don't not. Think any of our colleagues will <laughs> um, provide other comment. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Kova, are you asking for an amendment or for this to be tabled? I'm not proposing that it be tabled. I'm I'm asking whether uh, anyone would would support uh, holding off for uh, for for now um, on deciding about the 9,500. So I propose that we set that uh, temporarily in reserve to and, and make that decision later. Okay, I see Councilman Searcy and then Dabala. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to make sure that I understand the cost of the removal. Um, I'm sorry, I don't the, see that. The, rem the, the cost of the cost of restoration of the mural is $9,900. Okay. And the actual so, removal is not a major, is not a major, okay. from, from a cost perspective. Okay. Um, so there's a, a couple things. Um, so in terms of what Councilmember Kovar has raised, um, and, and he and I did chat, I do recall, you know, a number of my colleagues um, and myself also expressing that, you know, it's, it's not my cup of tea in terms of a, um, a mural or the depiction of um, black people in the community. Um, I would prefer if it were possible um, to really try to have and bring in more artists of color to depict people of color. That would be ideal for me. Um, also, another thing that we did not talk about is um, the fact that, you know, there are the pop there is the possibility of, you know, um, reconfiguration um, and movement of the gazebo in and of itself as a part of the junction project, depending on how all of that lands. So I am of the mindset that while it makes sense um, for staff to start making um, arrangements now to kind of rethink what would ultimately be an art piece um, that we could use there or some other location in the city. Um, I, I, I do kind of feel like we went from talking about not liking, you know, aspects of the art to we're going to take it down and give it back to the artist, um, which, I mean, I, I could go either way on it, but it, it did kind of feel like for me, I'm like, oh, so the recommendation is to just take it down. And so what would be left there? If we take it down, get it back to the artist, would it just be the brick behind it? There's a there's a, a blank wall behind it. And we would paint it or, you know, we could have some discussion about what goes there. I know there's even been a discussion of painting it with chalkboard paint and people could draw on it. I I don't have a I don't have an answer for that. Um but it should not leave a mess afterwards. It should simply just not have the mural on it. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 I actually would support um, the removal of the piece. Um, I would support us looking at the current budget allocation. I think that is for, that was originally um, slated for restoration with an eye for thinking about um, what a new piece would be. I know that it usually takes a few, a few, um, some, some time to do that. Um, and also to the point that was raised earlier, how can we make sure that this is a community, um, a community engaged project if possible. So, um, you know, I, I think that that would be would be helpful. Again, I'm torn. I recognize um, the hard work that the prior artists put into the piece, um, but I do feel like our world is changing around us, and we should be, um, you know, acknowledge that. So that was a very long-winded way of saying I get the sensitivities behind the piece that's there, but I would support the removal, and I would also support us thinking about how to leverage the dollars that were originally assigned for restoration to try to figure out how we may be able to bring in another artist to do a piece that's more indicative of um, the culture of the residents that are here in the city. So I'll shut up now, thanks. Thank you, Councilman Searcy. Councilman Dabala. 
Yeah, my question was following up on what Councilmember Cersei said. My question is a little is a little more general. So the resolution refers to um, types of projects that we would undertake without getting very specific, other than the mural. And then there's a budget which I gather is indicative of the kinds of work that might get done because it's not, we're not adopting the budget or this, this is my question. I think we're not adopting this specific budget and this specific set of projects. We're uh, adopting a direction. And in this budget that's outlined, I don't see where the money that was rest for restoration got reallocated to. So the 9,900 that does, doesn't seem to be here, um, but it's not clear where it went. So rather than get, so th I guess that's my, my question is, are we adopting a direction for how to use this money? Or are we adopting specific things to do with the money that are listed here? In which case, wh where did the 9,900 go? The, the $9,900 was kind of redistributed among these various projects, which were the things that were discussed prior in a prior dis, um, discussion with council. So, um, so there you know, isn't $9,900 to do something else in the. Junction. No, it would come, it would have to come out of sidewalk stamps or bike racks or bus shelters or public art maintenance. And so That's some combination there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if we pass this resolution, we're adopting the concept, but not this specific budget. Right. Correct? Right. We were, that's correct. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Councilman Bala, I'm just trying to keep track of where everybody is. Did you say where you were or just ask questions? I was just asking questions. Okay. Great. Councilman Kostick. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really happy to see the more detailed um, proposal here, and it's it's helpful. Thank you. Um, I support moving forward with the resolution as it is with the removal. I think we've discussed this, and I think um, the concerns need to be addressed, and, and it makes sense to me to remove the mural. Um, I also had the question that Councilmember Dabala asked regarding the reallocation of the funds and where those were. Um, I think I, I would like to see a great public art project at the junction. I think it's a great opportunity to have something really, really special there. I, I love the idea of having it be community oriented and community driven and having um, a specific work or works done by artists who are people of color. Um, I do think probably. It, investing in something in this particular location that can't be moved doesn't make a lot of sense since there are some questions about what the future of that intersection um, configuration is going to be. But I would love to see something there. And if there are temporary things that can be done or something that can be done that is movable or, or shiftable, I think that would make a lot of sense. Um, and then my other comment slash question is not directly related to this, but is a question um, related to public art in general. Um, that came up from a resident, which is an interest in um, developing a list of local artists that can be um, shared publicly with people. I, I think that would be a really great value, and I'm not sure if that's something that there is staff capacity for, but if, if there is, great. If not, maybe that's something that um, residents could volunteer to, to help coordinate in the artist community and, and help distribute. So just wanted to, to toss that out as something that might be an option in the future. I think, uh, thank you very much. I think on the first point, I really do think that having, a, having the Arts and Humanities Commission talk a little bit about what might be a temporary installation or something makes sense and to work with our staff on that makes sense. Um, I would, I don't know that it would come out of these funds and it may not take a lot of money. I mean, I think, you know, that's something that could be thought about when you get down to really significant permanent public art, you know, you're maybe talking $30,000. It's, it's something that's a different, different level of investment. If, you know, if we're really want, putting a wonderful park and you want the really good art that goes with that, it's a more significant investment. Um, the, um, there's quite a few artists that know each other and there's whole lists and groups so we could, um, we probably have most of the information. 
Um, but I think that um, that's something that we can uh, bring back to you and then ask, you know, if there's some gaps there. Great. Um, Councilmember Smith. Uh, first, I would like to say that I think that uh, this should be a great location for temporary art from young, fresh, black, brown, people of color, artists that are coming out. Uh, this would give them a chance to have uh, some of their artwork in, uh, on display in a, in a, a city that has valued art for many, many, many years. Uh, this mural needs to go, not today, but as, as soon as possible. Um, having the depiction of Black folks like this is, I just can't, I can't understand it. Um, so I do hope that uh, this mural comes down immediately. And, you know, if there's any other art that's similar in the city, uh, it should also come down. This is a new day and these depictions should not stand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to uh, concur that I support moving ahead with this um, ordinance as written. And, and um, I see it as a, a great opportunity for future art. Uh, I like Councilmember Smith's suggestion. Uh, I can see a uh, number of uh, good graffiti artists that even might use mm -hmm. the temporary space. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilman Dabala, did you want? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, I didn't ask this before, but I just want to uh, restate just one more time with feeling. So the choices with the mural are restore it in place or take it down to protect it. Leaving it in place and not restoring it is not a recommended option, correct? That's correct. All right. right. I and to restore, I wanted to say that one more that's time. That's right. And and even to restore it, it has to come down, and will take would take several months down to do the restoration work. So temporary art that would be in that place is not part of this budget, or could be. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, budget is not part of this budget, but could be. And so we would talk about what that would look like. We would get a recommendation from staff and the commission about what that would look like. That sounds great. I'm asking. Yes. I think that's I think that's what makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because blank wall, you know, but <laughs> I'm, I'm not I, a blank wall fan. Right. Yeah. The ideas that that have been put forward about uh, about temporary um, more lively. It, it also might generate some traffic to the space as it is now, um, which I think would be really good. Um, OK, thank you. Thanks. And um, I just say, you know, I think our staff has done a great job during the pandemic doing things with Chalk Art, um, Chalk Riot and other folks. Um, and so perhaps there may be something there for it like that. Um, all right. Well, Please don't forget my artists. What did you say? I said, please don't forget my artists. All right. Well, it could be rotating. <laughs> Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of children who we know um, love that space um, and we're decorating it last year and probably have lots of good ideas for what could go there. So I, um, great. Um, so not seeing any other hands and hearing from the majority of council, it does sound like folks are ready to vote on this this evening. Um, so we have moved it. Council member Siemens moved it. Uh, I will ask the clerk to call the vote. Council member Kovar. Aye. Council member, sorry, council member Dabala. Yes. Council member Kostic. Yes. Council member Siemens. Aye. Council member Smith. Yes. Council member Searcy. Aye. Mayor Stewart. Yes. Okay. Um, then we have the first reading ordinance regarding suspension of the committee on the environment. Um, Let's see, I'm going to share my screen again, correct? Or, well, I have, yeah. to, I have to pull it up first, so hold on. Um, and um, let's see, let me, as I'm doing this, let's see if I can do this and talk at the same time. Uh, I just want to thank um, all the members of the Committee on the Environment, everyone who has been um, 
on the uh, committee over the last uh, year or so in particular, a number of members um, have resigned recently and the members who were uh, still part of the committee um, at, um, voted um, last week, I believe, and sent counsel a note uh, regarding temporarily suspending their activities um, so that they may have the opportunity to meet with a facilitator and talk about racial justice issues um, and how their committee functions and even more broadly how our committees function um, so that they could provide input into the work that we're doing. Um, and I just, you know, we, uh, the city has been able to identify um, a facilitator to go through these conversations. They have already met once. Um, and so I just wanna, um, again, uh, thank the committee um, for um, doing this work and thinking through what is the best thing um, moving forward um, for this. Um, and I think Councilman Damala, did you want, do you wanna walk through this or I know you spoke to I would be you know, through my suggested amendments. Yeah. I am currently looking at a really beautiful set of flowers and not at it. Oh, and not, sorry. Okay, well, hold on a sec. <laughs> it's a good I, thing that's what was on my computer. <laughs> um, all right, let me try this again. I, and, and while we were at it, I, I would like to thank also the Committee on the Environment, current members, past members, former members from a couple of years ago um, for the work over the years in moving uh, the city's climate and, and, and sustainability programs forward. Um, based on uh, a reading of the ordinance that the city attorney sent uh, posted um, the committee on environment had three requested changes um, and i would like to propose them two are related they are in the whereas is and to clarify that this the committee on the environment is seeking to temporarily suspend their operations they didn't at the time under they were not aware of the process of, of having to request from the council and have the council approved. So they would prefer to have it say in that first, um, I think it's the second, whereas um, that they, that, that rather than that they requested it to have, the, have it say the city council received an email from them seeking to temporarily suspend their operations. And related to that on line 23, the next, whereas as part of the temporary suspension, they individually seek to continue this individual work with the facilitator. Um, so that's one package of two changes. The second, the second, um, second change is in the actual results. It's number three, and they sought some clarity about how, when, and how the committee might resume operations, and. Um, it already said that the city council can rescind, modify, et cetera, the ordinance. And it says that this ordinance expires June 30th, but they were seeking more, more clarity of what that means in, forgive me, skip plain English. So I'm proposing that we, ch that we change section three to say as directed by the city council. So the committee on the environment may resume operations as the city council directs, as we decide. Um, and, and as set forth in section four, it needs to be um, another ordinance. So those are the two sets of technically three three places I would I'm proposing to make some wording changes for clarity. Thank you. Okay. So that's a motion then. That is a motion. Councilman Devala's motion. Councilmember Siemens, you want a second? Thank you. Great. Any questions or? Hold on a sec. Um, Councilman Searcy and then Kovar. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you. Um, and, you know, I definitely want to thank the Committee on the Environment for um, taking a step back to reassess um, um, how it has been functioning. Um, one question I have is regarding Section 2. 
um, and that basically, and correct me if I'm wrong, we're taking a homogeneous group of residents, have them work with a racial justice facilitator, and then they make recommendations on how to seek to promote more diverse membership um, composition for the cities, boards, commissions, and committees. How does that work? If you're asking me, I think that the city attorney put this, I, I am actually not sure why he put the specific names of people in there. They are the names of the remaining committee members. The work uh, with, a with a facilitator was uh, suggested and begun uh, some time ago. And so it's a continue, it, it, it's a continuation of that, but as individuals, since there is not a committee. But I think Councilman Searcy is asking, why is this group developing mm -hmm. recommended strategies for the council regarding city boards, commissions, and Committees. Is that your question, Councilman? That is my question. I, I don't get it. Well, that's a good question. And and um, is is the city attorney on on the call since he prepared this? I think he was just take. He may have just taken it from the email we received from the committee on the environment. That's correct. It was yeah. not. It was okay. not something that he inserted. Yeah, I don't think he. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So so. I would actually um, suggest, um, while I, I think it's important and I think it might be beneficial um, mm -hmm. to have, um, I don't know how much it costs um, in terms of, you know, racial justice facilitator um, and whether or not the city is paying for that and how long is that happening. Um, but I would, I would advise against um, charging this group with making recommendations on strategies that we should use as a council to promote diversity. I think it's important that if we are trying to increase diversity in our, in our committees, that we are actually um, working to identify people of color to engage and to actually come up with inclusive strategies um, uh, you know, going forward. I also um, don't think that a group that is not only homogeneous in terms of race, but also um, in terms of their area of focus, which is the environment, um, can provide um, a holistic set of strategies that would be applicable to all of the city's boards, commissions, and committees. So I would encourage us to um, strike everything after um, may, um, so may continue their, their individual work with a racial justice facilitator, period, and strike everything else. And then the question would become, you know, some may ask, well, for what purpose? Are they continuing to work with their racial justice facilitator? That could be something that we could talk um, with the committee to see whether or not we should strike section two altogether and make sure that when we're talking about um, uh, trying to come up with strategies to make our membership um, to the committees and boards and things more inclusive, um, that we, we come up with another approach and maybe actually um, consider including the four individuals that are noted here um, as part of those discussions. But um, that was something that really stood out to me. Um, and it's also in, uh, there is also in the, in the third whereas clause that is also there. Um, again, I, you know, if we wanted to say that they, you know, are meeting with the racial justice facilitator um, to better understand strategies that could help them with leadership, I don't know, um, but but I, I was really confused by those statements. So I'll kind of leave it at that. Mm -hmm.
three. And I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Am I on? No, I'm not. On, I'm not on mute. Okay. Um, and I don't know after their first meeting. Um, and we can maybe ask um, the co-chairs and this our sustainability manager Gina Mathias to provide us with more input on what came out of their first meeting and what the plans are moving forward with the facilitator. The, fee, the what I did hear back is that the first session was very useful. So I don't, but given not much other details um, than that. Um, so yeah. we can... and and I I think as for me, I think that uh, Council Member Sears's point is well taken. That if they want to comment on ways for the community and the environment to be more diverse or or more or broader in its reach that that's different from committees generally. I, I, I'm surprised also now that I look more closely at it, um, that they would want to, that I, that doesn't seem like the best place to go for committees generally. Oh, for recommendations on committees generally, I agree. Council Member Kovar? Yeah, um, I, I, I agree with, um, Council Member Searcy's changes, and I'm not sure that we need to have their na their names in there. If somebody had said, um, but but I guess my my broader question is, we are going to be um, based on other actions we've taken <coughs> recently to put the freeze on appointments with exceptions uh, for uh, operability, so to speak, of of the bodies in question, or in some cases to promote diversity. But we're committed to developing and, and figuring out how to implement strategies aimed at this more broadly. And so um, as part of that effort, which should involve significant engagement with a wide range of residents throughout the, um, throughout the community, we're going to be, we've committed ourselves to moving toward a way of generating more diverse membership on all the committees. And so I suppose this fits in with that, but um, I sort of see the, the, the facilitator as more of potential benefit to the participants who are still on the committee as opposed to that being the, or a process to inform our broader, our broader work on diversity. So I think I, I do agree stopping both the whereas and the um, is all clauses where council member Searcy suggested makes sense w whether their names get listed. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense or not. So are you suggesting that we take the names out? I don't have a strong feeling about it. I'm just not sure why they're in there, but otherwise I, I, think, I, I agree. I, with I believe there was a suggestion. I don't remember if the city manager recalls, I think they're, I think there was a lot of concern at the time about, you know, who would even say they're on the committee and who gets involved in this. And that part of this idea is that it should be the council that kind of identifies who's on the committee and, and how this functions. That's all I heard about why those names were included. Um, you know, I think it, especially because when this was being drafted, it was at a time when some people were you know, pulling out or not deciding if they were pulling out. So it was a way to be clear. I don't see a downside to leaving them in there. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, this is a two reading ordinance. So if in the, if there is, we receive more feedback, we can, we can change that next week. Um, Council, um, Council Member Kovar, did you have anything else? No, thank you. <laughs> hey, um, uh, Council Member Searcy did, uh, uh, request a change. Did she make yes. that as a, way, as a motion? Um, we have not moved this yet, so we can move it as amended. Um, okay. So I am keeping track tonight. I've had my okay. caffeine. Um, so we could, uh, unless there are any other changes, we can move it as amended. Uh, would someone like to do that? Before we do that, did you, uh, I'm having a little trouble finding the spot where you removed yeah you did never mind I did. yes I you did. did that you, you've made um 
you've made council member Searcy's suggested changes, but, but I just, you just took the words out completely as opposed to using a, a red line. And so I missed it, but I see that you've done that. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Would someone like to move it? I will. Okay. okay sorry. Uh, hey, Councilman Duvala, hey. council member Siemens seconds it and any other comments or changes? Seeing none, will the clerk call the roll? Councilmember Kovar? Aye. Councilmember Dabala? Yes. Councilmember Kostic? Yes. Councilmember Siemens? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Searcy? Aye. Mayor Stewart? Yes. All right. Um, so that takes us now to our work session. And the first ses first work session we have is a contract for tree removal. I believe Daryl is on. Yeah, hi, uh, good evening. Um, this is an ordinance uh, authorizing uh, some tree work to take place uh, in the very near future. Uh, we have um, removals from city right of way as well as removals requested and approved through the emergency assistance fund uh, that the city offers. Uh, the process has been that we gather up requests, both our own as well as those that have been authorized through the emergency fund program uh, to get a number together. And then we go out for bid uh, from various tree companies for pricing proposals for those um, removals. Uh, so that's the the uh, item you have in front of you. We have seven trees that have been identified for removal. I believe two or three of them are in city right of way. Uh, the remainder are through the emergency assistance fund. And so um, we uh, made requests of four companies, got three responses back, uh, and we're recommending that we go ahead with XL Tree Service as the low bidder in the project. Sorry, Councilman Dabala. Yes, I just have one question. So the way that it works with the emergency assistance fund is not that the resident pays to have a tree down and the city then cuts them a check, but literally the city pays to have the tree removed. Yeah, we put it in our bidding process. So once we've identified uh, an applicant as eligible mm -hmm. uh, and on the assessment process on their tree and determine that it's a hazard or dead, uh, then it gets included in our list and we, we bid for the pricing and coordinate the removal, the schedule date, um, and take care of all the details. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry, Council Member Smith and then Caustic. Uh, thank you, Ms. Braithwaite. Um, when you remove these trees, and you and I have had this conversation uh, in the past, do you grind the stumps or does the contractor that you hire grind the stumps? Uh, we pay for that uh, in particular cases. In general, uh, we don't grind the stumps when the, it's a tree removal in a yard. Um, we make a determination as to whether or not we grind the stumps if it's in the right of way based on whether or not that would be a trip hazard. Um, in general, I'd say more likely than not, we do not grind the stumps unless there's a particular reason why we feel the stump needs to be ground because it would create a trip hazard in the right of way. And if we made it as a policy for the council to just grind stumps in general, what would that cost look like? Just, I, I, I know you don't specifically know. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to put sure. you in the spot. Just, just throw us a number so that in the future budget we can consider? Yeah, it, it typically ranges from uh, 800 to 1200 or $1,500 to grind a stump, depending on um, you know how large it is and what the surrounding conditions are. Uh, one of the things that we've um, you know found over the past few years is we uh, uh, more than use our budget for tree removal um, each year. Um, and in fact, in this current fiscal year, we added additional funds, I think 20 or $25,000 in addition, 
just to meet the need uh, for tree removal, particularly related to those emergency assistance fund programs. Uh, in the early years, we had just a couple a year. Um, now we're, I think, uh, already in this past calendar year, we've uh, done over eight uh, emergency assistance removals. And because of the uh, bug infestations, do you recommend if, if the tree is dying, do you recommend grinding stump in that case? Uh, not for the ambrosia beetle right. or, the, or border problem that we're, we're currently in some of our hardwoods. Uh, we do recommend removal of the trunk itself, so okay. it's not a, a spreader of those um, beetles or bugs, but the, the, um, the beetle is not within the stump itself. It's within the top 15 feet of the trunk. So as long as that trunk is removed off site and ground, uh, it's no longer um, spreading uh, that, that beetle or bug to the surrounding area. And finally, uh, Ms. Braithwaite, can you put in the FY22 budget what that cost would be uh, for a future council to consider uh, adding more money to your budget to grind stumps? Sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, for all your hard work on Flower Avenue. It's good oh, to see you. Councilman Costick. Thank you very much. Just a really quick thing. Um, I noticed that on the cover sheet here, the, the properties were listed for the emergency assistance fund. And if that's not necessary, I was just thinking in the future for privacy sake, it might be useful not to mention them in that context. Understood. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I do also wanna say, so this won't come as a surprise in the future, but the ideal way for us to deal with these tree removal contracts is to do a multi-year proposal with several tree companies. So the only real reason we're doing these individually is because we haven't had a staff position, you know, filled uh, for a while. And so um, our intention is to have a three to five year contract for these services with multiple tree companies uh, so that we won't individually be addressing this in front of the council and that so we can more quickly move to get trees removed as we you know, become aware of them. Uh, right now, I think the last time we had six or seven tree removed in June. So now here we are again in October doing it. So uh, in a more um, efficient process would be for us to have a multi-year contract with several tree companies and then do these monthly as they come up. So there's not this kind of delay in process. Great, well, thank you so much and congratulations on the new urban Tree, yeah. Yes, I look forward to <laughs> party. He's uh, going to be fantastic. Terrific. Well, thank you so much, um, and thank you for all the work you've been doing while we were in that transition. Very much appreciated. Um, oh, and they took down the sign today outside my house. I like. I, it's amazing. We were taking down the neighborhood watch signs and. Um, you know, the things that you don't see. And I was sitting and hearing a clang, 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 clang. I was like, what is that out there? <laughs> and they just took it out. So thank you so much for having them come by. Sure, I, I had to laugh that one was right in front of my house and the other in front of yours. We've done, we've removed <laughs> dozens of signs, but those two seem to have been missed. <laughs> I know, it's really funny. I didn't even realize until I was on the opposite side of the street one day walking and I looked up and I was like, Look at that, <laughs> there's one right there. Um, well, thank you so much for your work on that. Um, okay, and now our next work session is on personnel matters. All right, thanks very much. The, um, one of the major topics always in our budget process is personnel. And as we went into the um, FY21 budget preparation, obviously we went into lockdown with the pandemic. And so it was really one of these times when um, we had to make a number of decisions quickly. And then we had a lot of council discussion and staff discussion during the budget consideration about uh, what funds to put in the budget for personnel and how to handle those. Um, what we did at first was we um, froze all salaries at the FY20 level so that there were no increases on July 1. Um, nevertheless, we did leave funds for increases in the budget. What we did with that was recognize that we didn't know what was coming and we wouldn't know if we would need to do more hazard pay. We wouldn't know if there would be some other kind of special situations 
So the, um, the approach that we took was to freeze everything in terms of wages. A number of positions were put on hold and a number of other positions were cut. And uh, with the idea that we would be looking at this through the course of the fiscal year, and in particular, that we would come back in October and discuss them with um, the council. So in the FY21 budget, um, personnel costs total $19.4 million. It's a little bit over half of the city's budget. Of that amount, $12 million was budgeted for staff wages. And that amount exceeded what was a frozen level uh, by about $500,000. Um, and that was the discussion about having about a 4.5% increase, which was a combination of uh, a step increase and uh, a recognition of the um, employee cost index from the previous December, uh, as well as some funds for those who might get a distinguished on an evaluation. We also were in the process of having um, negotiations with our two unions. And so there was a lot in flux. Uh, one thing I do wanna mention is that the, the way that the city um, identifies the appropriate wage is by doing market studies, uh, what the market rate is in the region. And that's done um, every three years. Um, and in the middle of that, we reference the employee cost index to get a sense about how are the other jurisdictions adjusting wages. And in the past, uh, in December of uh, uh, 2019, it reflected a fairly significant increase because other jurisdictions had raised their wages uh, for state and local government employees um, at a higher level. So one of the things that I've been doing is really taking a holistic look at our personnel costs and our personnel needs um, in the city. And so what I'm uh, coming before you with are three resolutions for consideration next week and a, and a discussion for tonight. Uh, one of the resolutions is related to a retirement incentive program uh, that I've developed. Uh, another is to uh, approve a collective bargaining agreement with uh, our local 400, uh, one of our two unions. And then the other is to provide for a wage adjustment for certain lower level staff that aren't represented by a union and are not management. Um, also then tonight have a, a review of the hold list um, because it's, it is a good time to look at those things. So I'd like to start with talking about the Retirement Incentive Program. As it became clear that the pandemic would last many months, um, it also became clear that a number of positions that are heavily customer service oriented would not be needed at the pre-pandemic work levels. Um, and it happens to be that a number of these positions are staffed with persons who are eligible for retirement. Uh, for that reason, um, I was looking at, a, at proposing a retirement incentive program, which I believe would save some money this fiscal year, but would particularly save money in FY22 and potentially FY23 um, if certain positions are left vacant. And that's what I anticipate happening. I think I have authority to implement this program, but I do want uh, to have the council act on it because it is something a little different. So the incentive that I'm proposing is a payment of $750 per year of employment with the city with an, and also an option to continue with the city's health insurance for the retire on, retiree only for up to three years if the person is under 65 years of age. Members of the city's senior leadership team, which are mostly department heads, are not eligible for this incentive. There's about 15 employees who meet the criteria for this program. And my estimation is about four may accept um, and take advantage of it. Of these, um, two or three of the positions could remain unfilled for more than a year. And, um, if for some reason we don't have enough takers on this, uh, I would need to look at some layoffs of these positions that I think um, are um, not needed as much during the pandemic. 
And if that would be the case, then I would need to either I'd be able to go ahead and do a layoff um, if the person's not represented by a union, or I'd have to talk with the union and have that discussion if that's what we needed to do. I don't anticipate that being needed. I think that the retirement inter incentive program will work and will save us money. Um, and it could save um, it could save significant amount of money, approximately um, three hundred thousand dollars. One of the things um, I've been asked a little bit about um, who might take this um, of them. Um, there would be some that would be in the police department whose positions would be refilled. And then there would be some in other departments, um, some of which would need to be refilled because of the importance of their work and some that I think could be left open. I can't predict exactly which positions those are. Um, but even for those that are being refilled, there may be an opportunity as somebody who's not been here for 25 years or whatever to come in at the more entry level uh, level for that position. So there could be also some sa some savings even for that. I don't know if you have any questions about uh, this retirement incentive program. I think I, I just had one question. Um, I think um, overall it sounds like it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the things um, as you talk about positions possibly not being filled, I know we've you've talked about and we've talked about on the council um, thinking about maybe shifting some positions or really rethinking like we may have to have um, more child care That's right. in the future. Um, as you're looking at this program and thinking about the staffing needs um, is is that kind of is is that part of your thinking and the flexibility as you're looking at who we may need to hire in the future? Absolutely. I mean, I think you know what I really want to do is is get the right fit for where the where the job needs are and where the right people are, and um, we do a pretty good job of that. But um, we're a little bit different because we're in pandemic, and so there some of the service positions that that we've had in the past um, that aren't working the same way and while other people are just swamped with work and they really need help. And so trying to like get the right match for where the need is for service and where we can have savings is what I'm looking at. And with an ultimate goal of having, having more savings, but uh, it, it's also really to right fit uh, staff versus need. Um, I think, you know, we are not going to know until after Christmas, at least, when, what's going to happen really with the schools and if that will make a difference. This doesn't address that. Um, but it, I think the savings that I'm proposing uh, here and with the um, two other, three other um, programs, or two other programs, um, would allow us some flexibility if we ended up having to do those, um, hire some specialists for child care at a different level, that kind of thing. Right now, um, our rec staff is primarily our permanent part-time staff, and we have, uh, we are not employing the very many part-timers that we have had before the pandemic. So, you know, and you need different skills when you're dealing in a, in a pandemic with, with the health issues that are involved. And, mm -hmm. and that's part of the discussion about what are the right staff. Mm -hmm. And I also imagine as we're continuing our conversations on reimagining public safety and other things. Oh, there's absolutely. There's so many things that I think we're going to be changing that I think this is a this is a good program to put in place to provide that flexibility in the future. That's so. right, and and it also makes a difference too um, with the with the reimagining public safety. Um, as we have some flexibility in the police department, there may be different kinds of positions moved around or different talents that we're looking for. Great. Um, Councilmember Kovar. Thank you, uh, and thanks for the information. And you and I did talk about some of these things earlier, and I appreciate that. Just a couple of questions or clarifications. So, um, doing the math, if someone, say, had been here 20 years, that's $15,000, right? So they would be, they would stop at some point, they would get, um, a lump sum of 15,000 plus presumably whatever other uh, accumulated leave or whatever it might be that they're entitled to. 
Right. So the idea is that in the current year, if that happens maybe halfway through after Christmas or whatever, it is, the savings wouldn't necessarily be that big this year, but could potentially be bigger in the following year because then there would be um, a vacancy for... That's right. A vacant position, pres presuming that the council doesn't fill it. Right. <laughs> um, but yes, that would be the idea. And, and so um, of the people who are eligible... And I understand you don't know how many would decide to accept that, but accept the offer. But what's what are some of the longer tenures that those people have? I mean, are there people with 40 years who might you know be eligible for, for this? Or there are there are a few that are that far. Um, you know, many of the folks are in the in the, about 20 years. So on average, would the amount that they got more or less equal what they would be in line to continue receiving for their normal pay for the for the rest of the fiscal year? I mean, if somebody- It would be a savings. Okay. If the position's not filled, it would, be a, it would absolutely be a savings. But even if it's not filled, say somebody, I'm just making up this particular scenario, but if somebody leaves in January and accepts it and gets a, a $15,000 payout, would, on average, would they have earned at least that much for the remaining six months of the fiscal year anyway? I mean, how, how much do you anticipate if the number of people you think would be likely to uh, accept it, it would would be the outlay and, and would there be savings similar amount in the current year? Never mind, I can see why the savings would be there in the following year. And that's hard to answer exactly, but what's your sense about that? Well, I mean, if you just, you know, most of these folks are earning, you know, over $60,000 a year. And then they have the money that we pay into all of their French benefits and the health care and that kind of thing. So $15,000 is just not, uh, is, is, is a small portion. Right. So there's, there's savings there. And is there any, I don't want to say the word danger, but is there any possibility that a much bigger cohort of the eligible people might decide to do it and can we we talked about this a little bit on the phone can we cap it off at a, at a certain amount or once we offer it anyone who's eligible gets to take it regardless so what i did is i worked backwards i worked backwards from uh two hundred and fifty thousand dollars because if you had a couple vacancies of somebody two people that are making a hundred thousand dollars and plus all the benefits that's pretty much uh it's a it's pretty much the, makes up the difference. And then I worked backwards to figure out that $750. Now, most of the folks are not going to take it, so it's going to be much less than that. But but looking at a conservative level, that's how I handled this. I didn't do anything that I felt that would um, would end up costing us money even in the at the beginning. But if, but if um, more people than you anticipate take it, what do you think? Yeah, we know how many people are eligible. Right, but if, but you're saying of the eligible, you you anticipate a smaller number would actually take it. That's right? correct. What I'm just saying, what if it turns out that, you know, it's COVID, people just don't want to work. If with they it. all took it, we would be fine because that's how I structured the program. Okay. All right, thank you. Yep. Okay. Okay. Should I move on or? No, oh, I'm oh, sorry, Council. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. No questions. Now hands. Um, <laughs> Councilwoman Searcy. All right. Um, I just want to say um, thank you to the city manager for, um, I know that this was something that we had talked about um, when thinking through the budget and what are some options, and I appreciate the city manager um, moving forward. I think this is a, a typical approach um, that many organizations use um, when they are anticipating some, some budget challenges ahead. And so I think that this is a really um, – um, really good approach for for kind of managing the turn that we need to manage so thank you for putting in your and putting in the work on, on this particular initiative thank you council member smith and i would just you know echo those comments thank you for bringing this to the council so soon after we discussed this um before passing the final budget uh have we Done one of these uh, early retirement uh, offers in the past, and how successful was it? We've never done it before. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. I, I mean, every once in a while, there may be a, 
a particular person that we work a you know some kind of arrangement with for some uh, unusual reason but but that's we've not done an early retirement program to my knowledge okay great thank you council Mindabala. I just want to say that I think this makes sense, and I appreciate also that you took the uh, effort to work this out in such detail, um, and I, I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Great. All right. All right. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is um, our, the collective bargaining agreement uh, with the um, United Food and Commercial Workers Local 400, which represents our police officers, which are at the lower, beneath the level of sergeant. Um, and in that group, we have 29 officers. Um, it, that group represents um, all of our new hires that the chief has done uh, that are um, here for the, the strong community guardianship approach that we are looking for. Um, we were in negotiations with Local 400 when we went into lockdown and also with Ask Me uh, when we went into lockdown. And at that time, uh, you know, bef before the pandemic, you never had negotiations virtually, right? It was around the table in a room. It's, that's how you did union negotiations. So at first it was like, well, we can't, we just have to wait till the pandemic is over. And then it was clear that that wasn't going to happen and we could start meeting virtually, so we did. Um, we were actually pretty far along with Local 400 when the pandemic hit. And, and in fact, the actual agreement, uh, which is a collective bargaining agreement for three years, um, is not proposed to have many changes. Um, what we did change was what we would pay. Um, and everybody recognized the representatives from Local 400, and we recognized that um, the economy was going to be tough. This we didn't know the city's situation, and that we all needed to um, make some decisions about what we pay this year and then what we pay in the future years, having funds available to pay in the future years. And I appreciate that we were all trying to look at this from a long time perspective. So what, um, there was some discussions with uh, back and forth, um, also with council and members of, of uh, local 400 reps and our management and negotiating team. And what the, um, a three-year agreement was um, developed with a wage increase of just 1.5%, which is one step. And it was based on the FY20 wage scale. It wasn't bumped up by the ECI amount like we would normally do to reference the increases that happened in other jurisdictions. It's simply a 1.5% increase. And there's not even increases for people who get distinguished. And there's not special provisions for hazard pay. So this is a very small increase uh, for, the, for the officers. It, um, and if you remember what I talked about, these areas are, uh, we had put in the budget kind of a placeholder amount of four and a half percent, knowing we needed flexibility, not knowing what we would do. What this means is that um, for the 29 members of Local 400, there would be a total increased amount in pay of $25,000. Um, and it also means that there would be an opportunity, the 50,000 extra dollars uh, that would be in those lines would then come to the general uh, reserve, uh, the unassigned reserve, or it could be used for other purposes. Um, there's other items that were included in the Local 400 agreement. Um, there's provisions that are really standard. They reflect changes in federal law regarding payment of union service fees and changes in text related to the Maryland Healthy Working, Working Families Act. Um, and, and let me just go back. The other thing about wages, and this is something we've been doing for a number of years, is we renegotiate this on an every year basis because we wanna see how we stand in terms of uh, our fiscal situation. So this one and a half percent is just for this year. And if the situation's worse next year, then, then there may be nothing, or the situation's different, it would be negotiated differently. Um, there were uh, other text changes in the, um, in the agreement, um, some, um, 
clarification about when a weather emergency is, is declared, um, text related to administrative relief re for required training if somebody was in the National Guard or a military reserve unit service. Um, there were clarifications on the compensation when an officer serves as a field training officer with a new officer, as well as if an officer has some special skills, uh, it might be a hostage negotiation skill or that kind of thing, that if it's used, there may be some compensation for that. Um, and then there was one of the things we have to do in every collective bargaining agreement is we have to identify the dates that are holidays because the dates that are holidays for police officers are different than the dates that are holidays for, say, me. Uh, for example, we have a tradition if, um, if Christmas is on a Saturday, there's a tradition that Friday is off. But if you're a police officer, you don't want to work on that Saturday. <laughs> you know, so there's a, a recognition that the that the actual holiday is the is the holiday, and that's if you have to work on that day, there's a, an extra pay, that kind of thing. So that's these are standard contract items. Um, there's, I think, you know, I appreciated Local 400. They've, um, I think, we have a good contract with them, so it's easy to understand, and it has it doesn't require a lot of adjustment each year. One of the things we did look at, and obviously this is a year when uh, you know we're discussing uh, the various things with the you know Maryland um, Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights and other kinds of uh, provisions related to police officers. Um, there's not something within this agreement that needs changing uh, to advance the goals of reimagining public safety. This is uh, a this contract is very straightforward in terms of um, the kinds of things I just mentioned, which were holidays off and that kind of thing. And the other kinds of provisions are things that would be addressed either uh, in our conversations with uh, in legislation with the state, or if there was something specific about Tacoma Park, it would be done in general orders and affect all police officers, not just the 29 that are in Local 400. So I just wanted to, a note, to note all those things. I strongly urge the council to approve the collective bargaining agreement. I think um, I have I strongly appreciated that the officers, especially when COVID hit really hard, I appreciate that they agreed that just as you know, really keeping things tight uh, was in the greatest interest of our whole community and our and our fiscal. Um, situation with the city and I appreciated their help and I ask that that gets appreciated by the council and approves this bargaining agreement that would come as a resolution next week. Are there any questions about it? Not seeing any, do you want to just go on to the last point and then we'll come sure. back? Sure. So then the, um, the next item is uh, a resolution regarding non-union, non-management staff. Um, we have 12 staff who are at lower grade levels than management. Um, they are in positions that cannot be in unions. So they may have access to confidential information like in HR or in finance. Um, and some have some supervisory responsibilities, particularly in public works, where it's not a high level, but it's also a supervisory position. So they're, they're not a, a, at a position that's um, included in the AFSCME contract. Um, what I would uh, ask is that they have the same kind of uh, wage agreement that was just discussed with Local 400, which is a 1.5% increase with no additional increases for someone who gets uh, distinguished. I would like to note that these folks have worked their butts off. The, just the nature of their positions have been extremely difficult. Um, and many of them haven't, many of them can work remotely, but they have worked really long hours. And so they're not, they didn't get hazard pay when there was that time and that kind of thing. So I, they don't have an advocate because they're not represented by unions, they're not in management. And I would like to take this opportunity 
uh, to uh, make that wage adjustment. Um, the actual cost for these 12 employees is $12,000, saves approximately $24,000 from the budget that can be redirected to the um, unassigned reserve or to other purposes. So that's that would also be a resolution that would come to you next week. And I just want to point out to my colleagues that the resolu that um, this is already posted on the city website. Yes, I put the I did get them done, so they are posted for next week. Okay, just because it is you know our last meeting before the election, and so we will be voting on these three items next week, and the resolutions are already posted. There are three separate resolutions, all under one link. But <laughs> there are three. Sorry, um, three right. resolutions. Um, Council Member Kovar. Yes, sir. Thank you. Just a, a few questions, if you don't mind. Uh -huh. So you were talking about this. I might have missed it. I apologize. But in terms of um, reimagining public safety, one of the things that I've heard a lot about, I think we've all heard a lot about, has been problematic in other uh police departments around the country, and it may connect to the Maryland law, I'm not sure, is that in some cases, the ability or the inability, maybe we should say, of um, police who engage in misconduct to be disciplined is because of things that are written into the contract. And I think you touched on this, and but maybe I, I missed it. So can you just elaborate on whether that's issue and if not why not for us here yes we, we don't have those provisions in this contract um it, it is something that if the um if the leobr is repealed there could be a, a basically a contract grievance um but it's it's really not the same kind of thing that you might see in another um, police union contract okay um and we are of course trying to change the change or repeal the state mm -hmm. law. Yep. Um, so if we were to, for example, go along with the amounts that you're suggesting for the police, the 29 members of the police that it would, be, that it would apply to and the 12 that it would apply to for um, the non-management people, the other big piece out there is the AFSCME contract, which is a large right. number of people, and then management as well. And so are you saying anything for management, number one, and number two, certainly in terms of the ASME, does what we potentially agree to for UFCW, does that typically, is that a precedent that like uh, would be most likely to be adopted also or requested by, by ASME? So in other words, is, are we sort of foreshadowing if we went with these, what will happen with the uh, with, with the other employees? Well, we're still in negotiations with ASME, so I can't speak to that. Um, ASME represents about half of our employees, so it's a, a larger union. Um, and um, what I wanted to do was was not address ASME or management um, until the ASME contract is negotiated, and then then we would have a sense of what the funds are. Um, that's not to say that the members of ASME don't watch what yeah. happens in local 400 because they do right. but but how that actually comes out sometimes they're the same and sometimes they're not um, i will tell you our hr department always prefers that everything's the same just for logistics but that's not how union contracts are negotiated so we'll, we'll just have to see other components that. besides just pay obviously that come into play right that's right. right and some and some of the things um the ask me contracts more complex so so one other question and then i'll uh, and I'll let my colleagues talk. Um, you mentioned, if I heard it correctly, that if this proposal was adopted for the police, um, it would cost $25,000 in aggregate, and then that would, quote unquote, save or make available $50,000, which otherwise had been temporarily, potentially earmarked for the police at the time we did the budget. And then similarly, for the 12 non-union, non-supervisory or non-management, it's twelve thousand with another twenty-four thousand. So together, that's seventy-four thousand could have been used. Wouldn't be under this. And you said that could go anywhere. I mean, could we decide to put that into COVID relief rather than into the absolutely or on hold like the other on hold funds? Or 
and right. So what happens? So what happens to it is it goes into the unassigned reserve um, once once that adjustment's made in a budget amendment. Um, but what, for the next budget amendment, it's not for what happens next week, but for mm -hmm. probably January, we'll see this um, come forward to you about which line items it should go into or if it should stay in unassigned reserve. The um, I didn't uh, did note that we have budgeted about $50,000 for the facilitator for the public uh, ta safety task force. And so, so that's about, you know, I think we may save 50 to 52,000 out of the police budget for this, uh, for this action. So that may be appropriate uh, slide so to that. In a future budget amendment potentially after the new year that uh, literal decisions about what would happen with that quote unquote saved money could be made. That's right. Mm -hmm. right thank you. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to move on to the hold list? Sure. So one of the things that was uh, done, and I think Jessica's on here too, so she's she kept very good track of what excuse, was on the hold list. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Excuse me. I, I I thought I had my hand up. Okay. I please. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit more about the reimagining public safety goals. And so I did, when you and I talked, you said that the, um, the, that many police, uh, and I would just like to have everybody hear this, many police officers are represented by uh, the Fraternal Order of Police, which does insist on some contract provisions that could be problematic. We are not represented our, our officers are represented by a different union. And if I understood you correctly, those kinds of provisions have, in, have not been in the contract that this city, that this city has had with police officers. Yeah, I, just I, can't really, right, I can't really speak to other, to what the FOP or others um, have. Um, you know, it, it's clear that in some of the other jurisdictions, there's much stronger language or, or some different restrictive language in the contracts that are not in this contract. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's move on to the holds. Sure, so um, during the council's consideration of the FY21 budget, we cut a number of positions. Uh, we had a lot of discussions about, we looked through uh, positions that were vacant and uh, some of the positions we put on a hold list, uh, you put on a hold list. And um, so we have a list here in the package of the items uh, and the positions that were on the hold list. Um, there was a record specialist position in the city clerk division, which was cut for half the year and on hold for the other half. And what that means is that financially there's half of the salary for that position in the city clerk's budget. In police, a crossing guard and a crossing guard substitute were cut for half the year and on hold for the other half. In for public works, the vegetative um, ma maintenance supervisor was cut for half the year and on hold for the other half. The urban forest intern position is on hold for the entire year. In recreation, a recreation supervisor position was cut for half the year and on hold for half the year. And in HCD, the HCD director position was cut for half the year and on hold for half the year, as was the art intern. Um, there were some questions about the deputy public works director position. It was cut for the first two months, but then not on hold for the rest of the year. And we are advertising for that position at this time. For the other positions that are here, um, other than the housing and community development director position, which I do need, the other ones in some respects depend a little bit on what happens with the pandemic. And it's a little bit different, difficult for me to say that we need to have um, the recreation supervisor position uh, without us knowing exactly what happens with childcare or other kinds of activities. So, uh, and that's similar with the crossing guard and the crossing guard substitute. Those are positions that are not likely to be needed right away. Um, we are just getting our urban forest manager on. so. I think getting him up to speed first before uh, a discussion about the urban forest intern position is something that you would want to, you know, we'd see how that goes 
And my guess is that for most of these positions, it would be really a more coherent discussion in January when we may know more information. But I'm happy to answer questions. I just wanted to bring this up. We did promise to talk about them in October. The one thing that I think is new from when these were proposed is that when I was going through and thinking about the budget in the in the, those early months of the pandemic, it was a sense it'd be over by the end of December, right? So I kind of like put that, that we weren't doing anything for the first half of the fiscal year, but we would budget for the second half of the fiscal year for these positions. I now don't anticipate the pandemic being over till next summer. Uh, and so I just, I'm thinking about these things differently. And so uh, it's useful to have this discussion. I don't have a direct recommendation on any of these other than I would like to move forward with the HCD director position. But those those are things that I, I think are a good thing for you to think about and ask about. And so I wanted to have that discussion with you today and, and see what your thoughts are. Great. Thank you. Um, Councilman Searcy, you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, quick question. First, thank you so much for um, for this format. It's, it's really helpful um, to kind of see everything in one place. Um, so the, the, the costs that are in this final table, although are those just the salaries or does that also include fringe? Um, th these include French. Okay, okay, so it's both. Um, and so I know that you mentioned the HCD director as being a priority. Um, of the positions that are noted here, are there any other priority positions um, that you would like to see filled in, in the new year? Again, I'm, I'm holding pretty fast that, you know, even if we wanted to start recruiting right now, will not be the time. You're, you're thinking more early next year. But um, aside from the HCD director, are there any other positions that are noted here that you think are a priority for hiring? So, you know, no, I don't. I mean, I think the one that um, I know Daryl would really like the vegetative maintenance supervisor position, um, but I'm not sure how strongly she feels about that. And as I said, She's got some other hires she needs to get up and going. And so I don't know that she would really have the capacity immediately. I don't know, Jessica, if you have a different view on that, but but that to me is the I think she may have an opinion in January, but I don't think it's I don't think it's I think it's a little premature right now. I don't know, Jessica, did you have a any knowledge of that? Um, I mean I, I think a lot of um Daryl's had to do a lot of her administrative support work herself. And I think the more she's freed up, the more the department will be able to do. So I think it mm -hmm. would be exciting to get that supervisor on board. But like yeah. Susie said, it, there is a ramp up period. Thank you. Um, and I, I would just like to um, say thank you for this as well and bringing it back to us and fully support moving forward with an HCD. Director, I think as we're looking at COVID-19 and continuing it, um, you know, our HCD um, department is doing a great job um, and they're awesome. They're awesome and they need more help. <laughs> um, and um, I think having a director in that department um, is something that um, would be really beneficial. Um, so I would uh, fully support moving forward in that direction. Councilman Dabala. Yeah, thank you. Um, remind me the vegetate. This was not my original question, but remind me the vegetative maintenance supervisor is a new position or, or filling an existing position. It was somewhat. It was created after the previous gardener left, but it's at a higher level and it oversees um, both the the um, some of the maintenance in the gardens division as well as um, you know lawn mowing and rights of way and a variety of um, activities with the trees um, as well. So it's it really is to look more holistically at all the vegetation and overseeing the staff that works on that. So it's coordinated. So this isn't so much a question as just a statement. I continue to be really wary of bringing on new management positions 
or new man new bodies in management positions because of the cost associated with them. Um, and I wanted to, I did have a specific question about the deputy public works director that you can um, address tomorrow if you want, but I was not able to uh, pin down exactly where we spelled out in the budget season, which positions were on hold and which positions were on, um, were cut in the half a year and the two months and the six months. And I know there is a list from that and I cannot get my hands on it. And I would like to, to be able to look at what we, look at what we said at that time and just to refresh myself because I, I actually remember it somewhat differently as you know, we've talked about this, but I would appreciate it if you could look that up, one of uh, either you or Jessica and get that to me, thank you. Great. Um, not seeing any. So to potential, oh, Councilor Smith, sorry. Two quick questions. One, uh, why is it that those employees, the, those that are making, I guess, $15 or less, why do, why aren't they out of, and they're not part of a union, why aren't they automatically given a pay the same pay raise as we give union members. I'm sorry, I think, I, my internet went out for a moment. What is the so? So those uh, employees that aren't in a union, yeah, and and they are on the lower income scale, and for whatever reason they can't join the union. Why is it that they can't automatically get what the union increase that we? agree to uh, as a council? Why is it that it has to be? So, well, so the, the council is the one that sets the wages for the city. And so there's never been anything that said it automatically has to be tied to what a union um, negotiates. Um, in practice, it often is. Okay. So are there times when those lower income employees don't get the same wage increase? And if that is the case, why wouldn't they? So the so so I just want to be I just want to be clear that when we're talking lower wage, I mean this is they're they are, you know, they're not like our part-time employees or our interns. These are these are higher level than that. Uh, all of our employees make a, a decent salary because the council's made it clear that we have uh, a floor of at least 40,000 and it's a little higher now than that uh, of, for any full-time position and, and we go up from there. Um, in general, the, uh, the other employees that are not in a union, um, get a good increase and it's usually the higher if there's a difference it's at the higher level so we we look out for them okay and so uh when do you anticipate the council having to reevaluate fte's and where we are on staff are we going to do it again and or a future council will do it again in six months or next quarter well, I think I, my guess is that we're my guess is that we're going to be looking in January February range for at the next you know where we're standing then I think you know we're really trying to look at this in a in about a quarterly basis because it's a tight year and we want to be fiscally aware of where we're standing all right thank you um, is there any other direction you need from us regarding no, I would just note that this is coming back to you next week. Um, and I wouldn't, you know, I hope that you approve the three resolutions. And if you have any um, specific questions, please feel free to contact me in the meantime. Great. Um, I think the other question I had just about the hold list, and it might be a moot point because we're moving away from um, sidewalk season and doing that. But I do know we put on the hold list um, $500,000 in ADA um, sidewalk funds, $500,000 in re 
surfacing of road resurfacing and is that something the next council will come back to this winter and look at okay yes i think so i mean i don't i did not have that because i just was addressing personnel yeah no i just i while we were talking i was trying to find for councilman dabala the hold list and then i found that one so i was like might as well ask the question <laughs> um great all right um so that's so that will again is already posted to the city website the three resolutions we will be taking up next week um right. the next we have um as we were just talking about our wonderful uh hcd staff and our deputy city manager um uh, who is uh going to go over our COVID 19 support Great, so good evening everyone. Um, as you might remember, the last time we did a COVID-19 response update was in July for our July 29th hearing. So we are definitely due. Um, I'm gonna start with a quick presentation that'll be an overview. So let me share my screen here and start the slideshow and then Um, we will have an open discussion together in terms of our COVID-19 response. So my presentation, just a quick order. Um, I'll start by going over some of our uh, citywide COVID-19 infection data. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about testing availability citywide. I'll give an update on some of the COVID-19 messaging our communications team has been providing. I'll also provide an update on our federal and county reimbursements and spending to date in our COVID-19 relief fund. And then I'm joined this evening, of course, um, by our economic development division manager, Samira Cook-Gaines and our housing and community development manager, Grace Wiggins, who will provide updates on um, their COVID-19 response strategies. So you all are familiar with this data by now, um, thanks to data provided by Montgomery County on our Tacoma Park COVID-19 dashboard, we're tracking positive cases reported citywide, cumulative since the beginning of the pandemic, we're at 663 cases citywide, which puts us at a 3.7% infection rate. Um, that continues to trend higher than the county's infection rate. And unfortunately, we do continue to report new deaths. Um, that, that 65 statistic does include some of the um, unincorporated areas outside of the city limits in the 20912 zip code, but it's, a, it's an estimate. Um, and we certainly want to work together to get all these numbers going down. We do see some encouraging trends, the monthly positive cases reported is going down. So for instance, back in May, um, we reported, I think it was like uh, 232 positive cases. And then in September, we only reported 43. So that, that is encouraging, but much more than any of us want to see. So that certainly lends urgency to our work. COVID-19 continues to impact our workforce. So as you all know, 29% of our full-time staff are working re entirely remotely. And then since the beginning of the pandemic, at any given time, we had 12% of our staff quarantined. Um, so that's not all at once, that's again, cumulative. So four of our city staff tested positive for COVID-19 and 14 others were exposed or suspected exposure and were quarantined until they tested negative. So this has real service impact. So for instance, um, with one scare, we had to close our books to go service for a couple of days. And then most recently, one of our, an entire police patrol unit um, had to be quarantined until they received their negative results. So we're happy that all of our staff have recovered, but we, we continue to encourage staff to take every precaution. And even Roscoe's wearing a mask, see? Um, and then just a testing update citywide. As you all remember, we had county-sponsored pop-up testing that tested over a thousand people at our recreation center. That, we determined that that location was too small around the same time that the county had to switch lab vendors, which led to about a two month testing desert where the county wasn't offering any more pop-up and we needed to find a new location. 
So thankfully with partnership with Sligo Church and with Washington Adventist University, we now have a semi-permanent location. And this is key because um, with elections coming up, the county is actually repurposing some of the testing sites in Silver Spring, like the Civic Center, as well as um, another, the White Oaks Recreation Center location are becoming election locations instead of testing. So um, our, in terms of the county's overall testing plan, our location's important for them. And for us, it's great because it's within walking distance of a lot of our residents, particularly our renters on Maple Avenue. And just today, 148 people were tested. And as we have more time to advertise this, we expect that to go up. And I saw that Councilman Smith had um, advertised this on Nextdoor today. So thank you for that. And thanks for helping us get the word out on that. And then we do have one-time events that are being offered by some of our local partners. So Adventist Healthcare recently hosted an event. I think they have another one, as Councilman Smith mentioned, coming up Sunday. Coalition Homes and Maduni UMSI also have one time or short term events coming up. So those will complement our recurring testing. And I should mention too that a lot of the volunteers speak Amharic, multiple African languages. So it'll be accessible to all of our residents. And then our communications team has been working hard to help Tacoma Park residents really sift through the all of the information that is out there and have been highlighting resources for residents, again, in multiple languages on our Tacoma Park COVID-19 response page. That's really kept up to date by uh, Donna Wright, our communications director and, and other staff. And she is sharing that continuously in multiple locations online and mailing it out. So that's a great resource. And then City TV continues to cover the impact of COVID-19 in the city. So. They've interviewed a lot of our businesses, our childcare centers and crossroad businesses on how they've been affected by the pandemic. Um, they did the Mascarena video, which we all remember and, and a great guest appearance by Councilwoman Kostiuk's entire family. And um, so certainly, you know, creating a sense of community in this time of crisis through uh, ongoing city TV coverage. And then in terms of our FEMA and CARES reimbursements, we are submitting every, we're really throwing in everything but the kitchen sink here and, and trying to make an argument for all of our COVID-19 related expenditures to be reimbursed. So our emergency manager, Ron Hardy, has been taking the lead on these submissions. And so far, he's submitted three, around just under $370,000 um, to CARES and FEMA, of that 277,000 is CARES. And he's working on future submissions that currently tally 132,000 and counting. We, we hope that'll grow. And as you can see from the pie chart there, the biggest chunk of our COVID-19 related expenses are the business grants that um, have been very rapidly distributed by um, manager Cook Gaines. And then that's followed by our hazard pay and then personal protective equipment and other protective materials. We're also submitting for telework and our city attorney costs related to COVID-19 as well as staff overtime on COVID-19 projects. To dig a little bit more into the details, our FEMA reimbursements, which uh, FEMA has a, a narrower definition of what they'll reimburse for than CARES. So um, we're on solid ground with personal protective equipment here. Um, we've, we've had a harder time getting other items covered. So our first submission was fully covered at the 75% that, that FEMA offers. The second submission was hazard pay and FEMA will not cover our hazard pay because we do not have pre-existing language on emergency pay in our union contracts. And then in our third and fourth submissions, we also had some downward adjustments. So there were some items like um, the bags for our books to go program, FEMA decided not to cover. We also put step and pool fixtures on our bathroom doors that weren't covered. So things like that, that we tried to make an argument for um, were, were rejected by FEMA. So that was downwardly adjusted and then um, reimbursed at 75%. So we're expecting out of those first four submissions, and Mr. Hardy is submitting on a rolling basis so that 
Um, you know, we never know when the period will close. So we wanna get the submissions in as they're ready. So we've gotten 33,000 back out of the 92,000 submitted and he has another submission working for $14,000. And again, that's and counting, we're still adding to it all the time. And then for CARES, which is really the, the, the bigger chunk, and you'll see this from the pie chart, you can see this is composed more of our business grants, which FEMA will not cover, and the hazard pay that FEMA will not cover. Um, we That is under review currently by the county, and they got back to us at first. The 100, I have the duplication check column there because that is the amount that represents our small business grants. At first, the county said that they would not cover the business grants because they view it as a duplication of services. But then we responded saying, well, most of our businesses did not receive any county assistance. So if we can prove to you which ones didn't also receive county assistance, can we get uh, the reimbursement? So Samira is working with our business associations to be able to tell the county which businesses did not also receive county assistance. And it's only a small handful that did receive county assistance. So we're hopeful that, um, and the county said that they'll accept this. So we're hopeful that this will just be a small downward adjustment as well. And then the second submission has not been submitted yet, but it's working and that um, is up tallied up to 117,000 so far. And then in terms of our COVID-19 fund, so as you may recall, we did start to spend down on this in fiscal 2020. This chart only shows fiscal 2021. So in fiscal 2020, um, Samira did spend 55,500 on small, on mini grants, but starting in fiscal 2021, we had 440,000. And then we carried forward the unspent amounts in the fund from fiscal 2020, not including that 55,000 forward and that totaled 138,000 or about or thereabouts, giving us a total of 578,500 at the beginning of the fiscal year. And so far 101,000 of that has hit the books, mostly made up out of the mini grants and our healthy business initiative and just a disclaimer, this is what has hit the books, has been, has been fully processed so far, um, not the full amount that has already been committed. And I think Samira and Grace will um, talk a little bit about that um, in, in a couple moments. But we have 476,000 remaining um, as our balance currently in the fund. And then, as you recall, in July, Samira presented her res immediate response and rebuild strategy. And um, at, at that point, she had completed the small business mini grant program, um, giving out $105,000 in grants, which was able to assist 92 businesses. Um, she also completed outreach and funding to um, an additional, a wider net of businesses of 556 businesses. And, and in that July presentation, she provided a lot of visuals um, and breakdowns of the demographics of those businesses, for instance. So we're not gonna go too much into that today. We are squarely in the Healthy Business Initiative um, implementation. And as originally conceived, um, Samira had envisioned that this would include assistance with PPE, disinfecting and cleaning, public health signage, and testing for business employees as well. And as you can see on the right there, in terms of her progress so far, there's been a real, um, really impressive level of activity since our last update. And um, the execution is, is going well. We've got 68,500 in round one grants awarded to 45 businesses and we're starting round two. We distributed 1,100 public health signs to 370 retail and service businesses. And a lot of us were um, the boots on the ground in terms of getting those out to the businesses that have high public contact. And then um, Samira and her team also distributed 12 hand sanitizer stands and dispensers throughout the city and the locations are listed there as well as two business recovery cleanings and eight cleaning stations installed inside of businesses to address cleaning supply needs and shortages. 
So that's just a quick overview for you, but um, Samira is, is here to provide additional detail um, and to answer your questions on all of that great progress. And then just a side note to um, part of the Healthy Business Initiative is the Tacoma Park Streetery, the, the Laurel Avenue street closure that began June 12th. And our planning division has been conducting a public survey and they wanted to provide an update on that. They've received 110 responses so far. And as you can see from the green slices of the pie there, the overwhelming number of respondents feel very positively about the streetery. Um, the majority said that they felt very supportive of the closure. They also felt safe during the closure. And they also observed um, that many people are, are effectively doing social distancing there. So um, a lot of community support for the streetery. So that's great to see. And then just some photographic evidence of all of this activity. And we've got uh, Councilwoman Dabala there as one of our enthusiastic volunteers and the signage, et cetera, which uh, Samira can talk more about. And then um, the implementation of our economic development strategy continues and um, the Samira is lining that up. So I'll let her talk about that, but we know that um, she had these other pieces of her plan planned. So technical assistance to businesses as well as other miscellaneous forms of assistance and workforce development. So I'll just let Samira give you an update on that. And then our housing division strategy. So um, we know that this is certainly ramping up currently. Um, there are many households countywide that are struggling with rent payments. The primary sources of funding support for those households are the state and the county and our funding is intended to be supplementary. And evictions have now resumed, which is a huge change since our July update because district courts have reopened. Um, as Grace has directed to you all in the email that she sent, I believe it was last week, Tacoma Park residents who need help with back rent should call 311 for rental assistance and eviction protection from the county. Um, and Maryland Legal Aid has agreed to flag court cases that involve Tacoma Park residents and Grace and her team are already seeing a growing number of self-help evictions, which I'm sure um, Grace can share this evening. And Grace also had a very well thought out um, implementation strategy. She has five main areas of intervention. So emergency financial assistance, rental assistance, um, assistance to our condominium communities, assistance to homeowners with non-federally backed mortgages and assistance with PPE. So again, I'll, I'll let Grace go into that further. Um, and we received some detailed questions from Councilman Kovar that we're working through um, and that we'll be able to share um, with, with council shortly. But with that, I'll stop and um, Grace and Samira are here and ready to answer your questions and maybe correct anything I, I misrepresented um, and we can open to discussion. And I will stop sharing my screen at, um, for the moment, but I can always bring it back up if we want to discuss a specific slide. Great. Um, Grace and Samira, did you want to kick off with anything before council starts asking questions? Or <laughs> I'm fine with uh, waiting for the question and answers. I think Jessica had um, a very thorough update. Great. Terrific. Um, all right, so people can, uh, council members can raise their hands. Um, and I guess as we're I'm waiting for my colleagues to raise their hand, I will ask the first question, which is um, one, just uh, from your perspective, Grace and Samira, um, how, how are things going? Um, is there anything you need um, at, at the moment um, that, well, I'm sure there's things you need, but that the council can um, have impact on um, to make, uh, to facilitate your work. Grace, I'll let you start. Uh, you, I thought I was gonna let you. So um, good evening and thank you so much for having us back. Um, so to answer that question, um, Mayor Stewart, I think on the um, housing side, we're just still in a holding pattern. Um, it's hard to believe that we're still somewhat holding. 
um, because there was a significant backlog from uh, the court system that predated the pandemic and you know the, the halt in the evictions, uh, March, April, May, June, um, things have just really started. And I just wanna thank Jessica again for that summary. Um, I thought we would be at a different position by the time we got to October, mm -hmm. um, but surprisingly we're not. Um, I think the courts are seeing a small number of cases every week, um, both in Rockville. And what we've learned now is that you know, the district court here in downtown Silver Spring is also hearing some eviction cases on Fridays. Uh, and just um, for the councils uh, to put some context on it, we had a number of folks who were scheduled for court and because they thought they were going to Rockville and not to Silver Spring, they missed their court date. Mm -hmm. um, and once you get to Rockville, as you know, it is really difficult to get back to Silver Spring. Luckily, we were able to connect with Maryland Legal Aid. Uh, they covered those cases, um, which were eventually dismissed. But it's taken a lot of coordination um, to try to create partnerships. The biggest thing that we've learned on the housing side is the county is still trying to figure it out. There are a lot of programs that they've put in place. Some involve you having a summons, some involve you having um, having you become part of a target area. Um, and if you don't say the magic words, you don't get on that list. Um, so what I will say is um, our community partner and, and vendor must um, Ministries United Silver Spring Tacoma Park and an invaluable partner. Um, we've been telling our residents when we refer them to the county, keep the tracking number, the reference number that they're given, because once we have that number, our partners uh, on the inside can then look for their, their case to see where they are in the queue. And for many of our families, um, and I'll, I'll take a breath right after this sentence, for many of our families, it's the um, nervousness and anxiety is around not getting a call back from the county and falling several months behind in rent. The dollars that the county has earmarked uh, through federal funding, which is about $20 million, has to all be spent down by December 31st. Uh, and there are folks who are holding uh, and unfortunately, Tacoma Park is not a part of that high impact target zone for those that that pot of money, it's about $4,000. So we don't know what that process looks like. So a lot of folks have been holding on. Um, and then the last breath is many of our families have made payment agreements with their landlords um, out of fear because they just wanted to have something on the books. And they've been borrowing from family and friends and everybody and putting things on credit cards and what we're starting to see now is um, folks who are defaulting on those repayment agreements because they made them out of fear uh, and they were strongly encouraged by the county and others to make agreements with landlords uh, to avoid eviction. And now, you know, they're tapped out. So I'll talk a little bit about our efforts really targeting those folks to clear those balances because I think that's a real um, impact that our dollars can have moving forward. But I'll, I'll turn it over to Samira for some opening thoughts. Hey everyone, um, thanks for that, Grace. Um, just to give kind of a quick update, I know, um, and one of the questions that we've gotten um, are, how are our businesses doing? Um, not more of a uh, macro, how is our economy doing, but how are our businesses doing and starting kind of at the personal level. Um, and what I will say is we got in very early with our spending. We made a really quick pivot before the county came through, before the state came through, before the federal government came through, Tacoma Park was there. With that said, we have been able to... Um, really wrap a safety net around a number of our businesses, um, which I'm just, uh, you know, I did not have a crystal ball. Um, I did what I knew best to do um, as a active 
active and engaged expert in this field. And I'm just really grateful that the council was kind of with me for that. Mm -hmm. um, with that said, our businesses are still struggling, but they are also still here. Um, we have had six closures um, since the start of the pandemic. Um, the six closures have been in the Tacoma Langley Crossroads area. Uh, they have been small businesses with the exception of one, which is more of a larger organization. Um, and the industries, that's what um, I think might be interesting to you. Two of them were retail businesses, so clothing retail businesses. Two were professional services, travel agency, tax accounting, and two were medical, um, in the medical industry. So um, a doctor's office and a sort of a, a biomedical um, research-based uh, firm. So we have had six closures. We are working hard to um, really put our attention now on some of our retail businesses who seem to be struggling the most. Um, you can imagine for all the, all the reasons um, that the pandemic has really hit all of the businesses, the retail businesses where folks are not going in, specifically retail businesses where um, they have not been able to pivot online or where they were not ready for things like that. Um, our retail businesses opened back up uh, as soon as they were able to but the customers did not come back. Um, and I know some of you went on our business walk when we handed out the signs and heard that from our retail businesses that we're open, but the customers have not come back. With that said, um, a number of, um, I almost wanna say 100% at this point, but um, a large number of our businesses have laid off their staff. Um, if they were two and three people before, they're definitely one person now. So that's just kind of a general statement around the businesses. I, the need that continues to come back to us really very much relates to um, kind of the conversations that Grace is having. It relates to the businesses' homes, right? They are all asking for support with rent. Um, that's what comes back. That's what comes back whenever we are surveying, whenever we're asking for what additional assistant, assistance, rent is high on the list. Um, the other thing uh, that we have pivoted to, and this is not something that businesses will normally ask for, but the technical assistance piece. Mm -hmm. And we are working on a retail resiliency program. You guys know I love a good name for a program. Mm -hmm. Uh, but retail resiliency, our retail resiliency program would be a pilot program of, um, of five week intensive that includes everything from mastermind groups to um, peer to peer workshops and then one on one counseling. So we'll, we're going to start that pilot, um, I believe, first week of November, if I can, um, if I can make sure those dates work for the businesses and the focus will be a pilot program for our retail businesses, for um, a select number of retail businesses. Um, that is the general overview. I'm more than happy to answer any questions, um, specifically about spending. Um, unlike Grace, who is on hold, I am on fast forward with spending. Um, and definitely getting through and using to the best of our, um, to the best of our um, ability using the funds from the COVID fund that we set aside. Great. I'd like to just um, add one thing before you open up to, for the questions. Uh, one of the things that I think has been really clear is that while money is important and needed, it's the ear on the phone it's the, it's the messaging that says we're part of the same team. It's the here's where you go for help uh, messaging that has made so many folks feel appreciated and hopeful when it was otherwise really hard. And so this is a place where 
yes, there's cash, uh, or there might be cash, uh, but there is a hand. And that's really, uh, that's, I think that's the thing that has made me happiest about this time is that people really do feel like we're there for them and that we will find a way to help them, uh, even though it's a struggle. And so I just want to um, give kudos to my staff for, for sending all that messaging and really being, um, you know, it's, it's one thing if you're holding on and, and the money's tight and you don't have hope or you do have hope. <laughs> and so I think part of the way, reason that we haven't had very many closures is that there feels like there's a partner here and, and that they're, if they can hold on a little bit more and do something else that they'll make it. And so I just wanted to, to give that, that it's, it's not all about the money. Mm -hmm. And, um, and to that point of who of the closures, um, we have started our reporting from the first mini grant. Um, and we've got about ugh, maybe 35% back. And of that, 91% of our businesses say they believe that they will be here through 2022. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there's something like, in the rest of that percentage, they say they're not sure. They just said they were not sure. Not that they, in there. so there is an option to select whether or not you believe you'll be closing. Mm -hmm. And none of our businesses have selected that. Cool. Um, I had a question um Samir if you again on um, workforce development and you know one of the things that we are hearing or I, I'm hearing from people um is um you know needing to transition jobs or have lost jobs um and things like that and I know you had um just kind of gotten a lot of workforce development work underway um, pre-COVID and did a few things um this summer but just kind of seeing where where your plans are for that yeah, I will um, invite uh, my colleague Grace off of mute as we answer this question together because um, <laughs> Grace's office is where the touch point is for workforce development. She often sees folks who are in some level of housing crisis or assistance need. And once you do the math on that, it really comes down to not, not being able to afford your life. Therefore, needing some level of additional income often pivots to workforce development. So a lot of folks come in through, um, through the housing front door. With that said, um, we have continued our relationship with WorkSource Montgomery. There has been a little bit of a stutter step um, with the transition to virtual um, that short time frame of once a month and then um where the, where's the zoom link who's got the zoom link how do you get this person on have we checked if they have um internet access so there's been a lot of um working through the complexities of um suddenly online with that said grace and, and her team also have the community grants program and prior to the pandemic, this is another thing that was just really, um, you know, testament to Grace's foresight around managing these programs, because that community grant, we um, discussed this need for workforce development and leveraging new partners. Mm -hmm. WorkSource Montgomery is there, you know, paid for by taxes, et cetera. They are also a free partner. Now, what we need is something a little more dedicated to Tacoma Park. Mm -hmm. uh, we had our pop-up and that's working, but it's also once a month. So Grace tied in a workforce development um, piece or request to those community, um, those community grants. With that said, we have two partners in particular who we are working with um, and as they specifically reach out and work with our Tacoma Park residents, those who are pivoting, those who are leaving, um, for example, we have another, a number of folks who are leaving the healthcare industry and looking for other options due to COVID. Um, those folks are getting more uh, concerted attention. And from there, what we get is kind of a report out 
And that report out is where I plan to spend our $25,000. There are things that those programs won't be able to pay for. For example, transportation to and from work until you get that first paycheck. Um, they won't be able to pay for your option to take maybe a certification test a second time because you didn't actually pass the first time. There are some things where we can leverage our funds to really um, better assist our new partners. And that's what I want to emphasize, that workforce development right now has to be a lot more of a closer touch um, and it's got to be something where our $25,000 is not something that you can spread. It's something that's got to be concentrated on particular, um, particular folks who have already gone through a workforce program um, and need that extra bridge just to get to actual work. Great. All right. Well, I could ask you questions all night, but let me turn to my colleagues, um, Councilwoman Searcy. We can't hear you. Sorry. We can't hear you. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Awesome. Um, we have to stop having you all at the end of the night. It's not fair. Um, we got to change that. Um, so. I have a few questions, and I'm going to try to, you know, hold back a little bit. Um, Samira, I appreciate you bringing up um, the vacancies that are um, currently in the crossroads. Um, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is, historically, the crossroads area was um, the place where we never had vacancies. Um, it, it was typically a place where the minute a business turned out, there was a new one, it's like there was a line of people waiting to take their place. Um, so this is a really interesting time for the crossroads for, you know, to have vacancies and in some cases very large, you know, square footage sites that are becoming available. Um, so one question I have for you is about um, and I've talked to some of the business owners, they really are struggling with developing that online presence and marketing and really trying to get people to know that they're open. Um, would the retail resilience program include aspects of marketing, um, establishing websites, you know, really trying to get that presence known so that people will know where they're located and that they're open? Yes, um, there'll be three phases. The first two, the first phase is really a focus on workshops, so kind of the business basics. The second phase is a mastermind model where you are specifically um, focusing in on kind of shared challenges with your peer industry folks. And then the third piece of that would be the one-on-one -on -one consultation with the same folks who have been with you through workshops, mastermind, consultation. And our end of that, by the way, will be the financial support needed. So once a work plan comes out, for example, getting started with a website or helping someone with a Shopify or an e-commerce site, and they need the cash to start that up, if they've successfully been through our program, they'll be able to have the financial assistance to get that moving. So as a part of the business basics piece, the marketing is um, a strong piece of that because they are asking for marketing. And do we, in terms of uh, the property owners of those parcels with a vacant storefront, have we done any outreach to them at all to see if, if you know, what needs they may have in terms of, you know, because one of my biggest fears is having a bunch of empty storefronts, you know. My um, biggest fear too. <laughs> so have we, have we started doing some outreach to some of the, the, the property owners around, you know, whether or not they're experiencing issues um, with, you know, kind of recruiting new businesses to take over some of those spaces. Yeah, so it's interesting. So this is kind of a typical economic development um, task, right? Business retention, business attraction. 
and business expansion. Uh, Tacoma Park does not have a lot of opportunity for expansion because we are built out and we have not built new commercial spaces for expansion. When it comes to business attraction, we've done a really, um, excuse me, business retention. That's really where we're focused right now during the pandemic. We're just trying to get people to stay still. We don't want any more closures. Um, but the business attraction piece is a little bit new because as you said, in the crossroads in particular, their vacancies have been under 2%. So these commercial space owners don't actually have a, um, a history of needing to solicit new businesses. They are not necessarily taking active steps to bring in new business. Um, and I think it's, um, it's a smart thing to do right now to kind of sit still and you know hold those spaces available. I don't... Um, we don't necessarily have right this moment um, a list of folks who are trying to get into Tacoma Park. Mm -hmm. We do have a list of a few people who are in Tacoma Park and want to expand, um, but um, not all spaces are equal. So the expansion conversation, again, is a little bit heavier. Um, but yes, there's not a lot of business attraction um, activities going on in that kind of typical economic development way. Um, and the commercial property owners are really um, <laughs> expecting that new businesses are going to be there. For example, we have had a pandemic opening, our Brazilian bakery, and oh. it is doing really, it's doing well um, despite everything. So again, Tacoma Park is still kind of true to its form in that even during a pandemic, that space was taken up. Mm -hmm. Great. And one, this, this next question is for, for Grace. Um, so we talked a lot about evictions. Um, has there been any, um, any thought about additional resources to address food insecurity? I know a number of, um, uh, residents in um, some of the multifamily buildings are working with local nonprofits, um, Small Things Matter, um, around food insecurity, um, and also homelessness. Um, I have started to see more, just more people homeless, you know, out and, and with nowhere to go. Has there been any additional efforts working with partners around, you know, increased homelessness in the city? Um, as well as food insecurity. You must have been on a, on a conversation with myself and Samir earlier today because we just had this conversation <laughs> about homelessness. So you're re you're doing a lot of mind reading. Um, hopefully you'll have the lottery numbers for us tomorrow. So um, let me start with that first um, because I do think it's something that I've talked to the city manager about uh, at length uh, and the mayor because I know that several council members have encountered an increased number of um, homeless individuals in our city. Uh, and we know where that's coming from. It's the libraries are closed, stores don't have spaces for people to just sit. Um, and you know, there's a lot of that going on. Um, and so Samir and I talked just today about the need to have a more comprehensive approach here in our city to look at this issue of homelessness. What are we gonna do? It's not just about bringing in one partner, it's really where are we seeing it and how do we decriminalize the, um, the fact that you don't have a place to live? Um, and so I think a lot of the um, businesses in the crossroads, especially, and we were referencing Ward 6, have seen you know, homeless folks either in front of their businesses or in the, you know, the grassy areas and, we just don't know what to do. Um, but we're also seeing them at our gazebos and they're hanging out in cars in our parking lots. And so I think to be fair, we need a comprehensive approach. Um, we need a protocol, we need a way of addressing this and it's not gonna come from um, some of our usual partners because I think folks are thinking about this differently. The city has to deal with this differently. Uh, I know Councilmember Kostic and I worked together on with um, one of our phenomenal residents who said, 
just come to my house and I'll take care of you. Um, and you talk about being generous, um, but it, you know that's kind of like a landlocked way of looking at it. There's nowhere to go after you've exhausted a number of days um, with someone who you don't know and you, you don't know what the story um, is behind the homelessness. Um, we've started making um, and developing relationships. Um, uh, Mayor Stewart has been um, incredibly helpful in that area uh, and working with um, County Council Member Hucker's office in just having a conversation with the parties at HHS and other nonprofits to figure out, so what needs to happen? I mean, one of the big takeaways that we learned is you know, the question is, when did you come to Montgomery County? And for many of our folks, they're not Montgomery County residents, which means that you can't get them into the system. And so folks are coming from as far as Baltimore and kind of migrating to Montgomery County uh, during this time. And so I think that conversation was a real kickoff. Uh, it involved one resident, but really had an impact over a bunch of our homeless folks in the city. Um, and we wanna be humane because we're gonna to begin to see more and more people. Um, I know Jessica referenced some self-help evictions that have already started. Um, so that process is where a landlord prevents you from coming back into the property. And many of our landlords have become frustrated. Many of them have unlicensed rental properties in our city and that's created instant homelessness for folks and um, the one thing that we do really well is we will scoop people up where they are and start figuring out what the strategies are to get them stabilized. Um, you know, I've said this before, I'll continue saying it. We don't necessarily live in a tenant friendly state, meaning we don't, do not have protections for many of our tenants uh, just because there's no just cause law, which means on a 60 day notice, you could be forced out of your home and you could have lived there one day or a hundred days or a hundred years, it, the law just is not friendly to tenants. And so we've dealt with a lot and I know council member Kovar had questions about, so what are we seeing? We're seeing a ton of 60 day notices where landlords have said, I'm not gonna take you to court for failure to pay rent. I just want you gone in 60 days. And for many of our families, that's incredibly difficult to come up with the money to find a new place, to come up with money for a new place. Um, and then, you know, someplace that's comparable to where you're living. It's tough because many of our units aren't uh, in this area. People aren't moving. So the inventory is very low. Uh, so, around so, Grace, if I could just interrupt for just one second. A, a number of the things that you've spoken about, as we talk about reimagining public safety, there's interaction here because it's, how we're dealing with the people who are out on the street. How do we deal with those who have mental health challenges? How do we deal with these, you know, these 60 day evictions and, and how does that all work? And it's, it's best if it's done really through a human services approach. And so how we orient that, um, you know, we do need to get it right, but it's not an easy, <laughs> it's not an easy answer. And so we're, we're going to be working on that. We'll be working on that. But I, I just want to also note that our police department is looking forward to that discussion because it helps them as well. It's really important. Um, and it, it, thank you for mentioning that, Susie. One of the things that we're doing more now than um, prior to the pandemic is um, a lot of cross referrals. So we've been working with neighborhood services pretty closely because we know that a number of families are struggling with um, repairs in their homes, um, things that are visible from the exterior, um, observations by our neighborhood um, services staff. Uh, and to kind of tie it back to um, commercial businesses, you know, we got a referral from our neighborhood services program that there was someone that was living on a property that was a closed business. And could we step in and try to help? Um, and so there's a lot of desperation and a lot of people kind of hiding um, in, in pockets that we didn't know. Um, we're also working uh, closer um, with victims of domestic violence, um, which is something that we hadn't done before. Uh, and some of the money that's been dedicated for COVID-19, um, just to give you some context, um, you know, we got a call about a survivor. We worked with her 
Um, and the landlord said, well, I'll let you leave, but you're going to have to repay the money that you owe for the rent that, you know, you just, she had lost her job and other things. And because of her survivor status, she couldn't pay it. And so she was prepared to enter into a payment agreement that she knew she couldn't uh, sustain um, with her income. And so the city was able to swoop in and say, look, we're just going to clear that balance. Because the one thing that happens when you leave a, uh, leave a rental unit with a balance is the next landlord wants to know, so where did you live before? And let me call your landlord. Um, and we wanted, especially folks who are survivors of domestic violence, to be able to have a clean start. And, um, and this person now has the ability to have a clean start during COVID. Um, and it, it's because of these dollars that we've allocated. Um, I, I do want to talk about Food Council um, Women's CRC because I think what we've been able to do over the past, I guess, two to three months is, and thanks to our city manager, we've been able to be an active part of conversations with the county around food and real serious conversations. And so we understand that there are folks that are in need, that need food, that are food insufficient, and we, we get it, right? In food insecure. Um, you know, I've said this, and this will sound like a, a record, so um, get ready. Um, the SNAP program is the stable um, program, um, federal program that will help families to sustain during this pandemic. Um, I love the work that's going on with food hubs. I love what's going on with grab and go boxes, but we have got to figure out for families that are eligible, how we can get them on a sustainable, um, you know, f uh, connected to sustainable food. And then, as I've said before, the connection with economic development is just, you know, it's a no brainer. As soon as they get an EBT card, they go to a local supermarket and they swipe that card uh, and, you know, a business stays open because they, these are dollars that would not otherwise be used. The other thing and I want to say is, and that's the point, um, you know, we often yoke um, our lower world families by saying this is what we think you want. Uh, I just had a conversation um, last night with a friend. We were talking about what's a traditional Thanksgiving. Well, it's not necessarily turkey for everybody. And so... We want to make sure that families can get the food that they want and that they're going to use. And what happens and what we're noticing in many of our multifamily buildings is food is being thrown away because either families don't want it, they can't use it, and they can't give it away. Uh, and so there's a place for all of this, but I do think the, the voice of SNAP and more sustainable food dollars has been... Um, it's lessened because of the idea of let's just grab and go, throw it in my trunk, let's keep moving. And, you know, those pallets of food are being reduced. Um, we, we just have to be honest about it. And many of our families won't be able to access those food, um, those food opportunities. So at the multifamily buildings, I think we really want to know what the need looks like. I, you know, I'm a part of a small working group now on um, SNAP. And the one thing that we talked about this week was, how do we know what the food need is if we're, we're not having a conversation about who has what? So what's the gap that we're trying to close uh, and who are we trying to close the gap for? So I'll leave it there, but because um, I could talk about that all night, but um, we just don't have all night. So, but you know, we're a part of that conversation. We're working with uh, Maryland um, Hunger Solutions and Montgomery County, Food Council, I, I've been invited to join that council. Uh, and I think this, I don't know if the city of Tacoma Park has been a part of the Montgomery County Food Council. They've invited, um, they've invited me to join their board and their council uh, on behalf of the city of Tacoma Park. And I welcome the opportunity to do it because we need to have a voice at the table um, to talk about the real need here in Tacoma Park. So I'll take a break. Great, thank you. So Alicia, I just want to add that the business associations, um, both of them, I meet with them weekly um, since March, since COVID. We went from our monthly meetings to weekly meetings. And we have been discussing the homelessness and how the businesses can be a part of the solution. So just to let you know, um, 
you know, um, our city manager just mentioned that the police department is interested in being a part of that conversation. So are the business association and the, our business leaders. Um, they specifically want to know how they can help, what sort of resources um, they can kind of bring to bear, even if it's um, identification and location of folks who, um, who they see in the commercial districts who need that homeless uh, resource assistance. Thank you. Great, thanks. If I could just go ask Grace a question um, before turning it to Councilman Costick On the SNAP program, um, are there conversations and have you seen um, the impact of um, particularly our immigrant communities not wanting to partake in those programs because of um, the f new federal policy that went into place that will count, um, you know, if you get public benefits um, when you apply for citizenship? And are there conversations going on about what what else we can do? Um, for those yeah. families, I know that's a big question, <laughs> and, and no, um, it's, it's you know. I think it's a, an appropriate question. Um, we were just on a, a Zoom this week where we were talking about a full on campaign, and so that's working with the village of Tacoma Park, it's working with the test center, which is our community action agency that's partnered with the Department of Health and Human Services, it's the Crossroads Food Market, the Food Co op, Tacoma Park, um, Silver Spring Food Co op. Uh, we brought everybody to the table, cheer, because we want to figure out who's doing what. Now, um, many people know the charge rule, but they don't know how it applies, um, and that's what you're referencing. Um, and so what we've decided to do is to speak in one voice so that when we're talking about SNAP and we're talking about food, we're all using the same language and the same kind of glossary because there's there are a ton of misconceptions. and Many of our families miss out on benefits just out of misinformation. Um, Montgomery County has the, lar the, the smallest, uh, just let me go back. Montgomery County has the lowest um, SNAP enrollment in the entire state, hands down. Uh, and we're the largest county in the state, uh, which is hard to believe that we, we don't have more. There has been an influx of um, new applications. So it's gone up by 23,000 um, folks who've applied and have been awarded um, SNAP. But that's because of the pandemic. There also is another level of um, SNAP benefit called pandemic uh, food stamps. There's also been an increase in the, the amount of food stamps that seniors can get. It used to be a very low number. And I think right now it's about $100 as the, the entry point. So we want to get a lot go of good information out to people um, and destigmatize um, this benefit because when you go in with that EBT card, nobody knows what it looks like, uh, but businesses do know what it looks like. It looks like money coming into their um, their establishment and you know the ability to stay uh, afloat. So, great, thank you, um, Councilman Costick. Thank you both so much, um, and a, a lot of my questions have been answered already, um, which is great. <laughs> um, I just wanted to follow up um, on the the discussion about homelessness, and um, really thank you very much, Grace, for the work that you've done on this um, with the the residents um, that I've um, encountered who themselves are experiencing issues or are aware of others who are, um, and I, I absolutely support the idea of developing a more comprehensive plan for what we're doing here in the city on homelessness. I, through the, this process of working through a couple of these, it's been really eye-opening for me to, to see the gaps and the challenges in, in accessing service. And I, I think as we're going into winter, with a lot of these places like libraries being closed, for example, and places where people could typically go during the daytime, um, being closed, I think there's going to be an even greater need. So I hope there are opportunities to look for ways to help people find shelter during the daytime as well as at night. Um, and, and then kind of on that theme um, in terms of winter coming, I'm wondering um, for small businesses, particularly for restaurants, if there is a sense um, 
that people won't be eating out as much, using outdoor spaces? Are there concerns about what the wintertime will look like and things that restaurants can do to prepare for that? Yes. Um, so restaurants, a lot of restaurants are at a um, decline percentage capacity indoor. Um, so that is happening. I do expect and the restaurants expect for, um, you know, if cases go up that those, you know, allowed 50%, for example, will drop drastically or be nothing at all. Um, with that said, they are really gearing up to continue kind of with the carry out conversation that, that started back in March. Um, so they, they kind of have the expectation of how far the band stretches, you know, it'll be, you know, right now we're a little further in, we have some outdoor seating, we've got some indoor seating, but it may um, really contract to the point where um, it's just to go. And that's where we are the way we were back in April, back in the spring, <laughs> back in the spring where we were. Um, and I will say more, the more information we have now on the virus, for example, you know, folks were not sure that even eating out could be okay. And, you know, whether they needed to reheat their food at home in the oven at 300 whatever degrees to kill the virus, all of those things um, are things that we just have more information on now. So I will say that the restaurants are probably faring I mean, aside from online stores, are probably faring the best in our city. Um, still not great. Um, alcohol sales help. Um, and literally not even a joke. The alcohol sales, the takeaway alcohol sales really have been um, a benefit for a number of our um, restaurants who have never done something like that before. So they're hoping that the to-go piece is kind of where they'll have to go, which is the worst case scenario. Um, and, you know, right now outdoor heaters are sold out like Lysol wipes. So you can imagine um, it's something that we tried to push really early um, during our healthy business initiatives. Not many of our folks jumped on it. Um, but I do think that our residents and patrons are actually ready to, you know, bundle up a little just to continue to patronize our restaurants. Um, just, what I just will say, a, our folks, have, just, our residents have been very committed to helping our businesses stay alive. They absolutely have. The other thing is the county does, has been promoting the idea of, of some grants for heaters and for not complete tents, but something that's at least a little bit more so that it can extend the season a little bit longer. We have some problems in that we just don't have as much space as some other locations as well. So the carry those, out makes a lot more difference. Yeah. Yeah. And those county grants are the same exact grant that our businesses were not getting that Jessica kind of spoke about. Um, the county has not really pivoted well on administration of the grants, how to get them out to folks, how to actually um, help people apply for these grants, especially our businesses. Um, so we have been promoting the grants, every single grant and version of it since it landed and through our online system that we have now and started in March, We've been very diligent about getting that information out. Um, again, I do think the administration application process, those logistics are hurdles that are a little bit too high for some of our businesses that still need it. Great, thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I know there are a number of others who have questions. So just one other quick um, question. I I'm wondering if you have any updates on how childcare businesses are doing in the city? The childcare businesses are um, also a part of our resiliency um, technical assistance program. Um, they are taking a little bit longer to um, pull together. It's mainly timing for them. So the ones that are open are open during the day and, you know, how we uh, work out the timing is taking a little bit longer than it was, um, than it would with the retail businesses. But um, 
we have one that is closed and that closed early on um, with the passing of one of our um, childcare business owners. Um, we have a second that is closed um, and they are closed until they can complete an expansion and then bring back all uh, 25 or so of their kids. They can't operate at half, per, at, at a half percentage. It's just not financially viable. So they're working really hard to get um, their expansion completed. And the expansion, by the way, is a build out. So will take a while. Everyone else is um, really combating with uh, reduced revenue because they're at 50%, um, but increased cost because of, you know, all of the cleaning and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we are still very much available to them. And we have, um, of the five major, as in large, daycare providers in the city, we have given grants to four out of that five. Um, and we expect um, that with our additional funds, as we move further into um, the school conversations, et cetera, that um, we'll be really um, spending a little bit more money just with simple financial assistance for our daycare providers. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I was attending a, um, a human development committee meeting through the National League of Cities not that long ago when we were talking about child care. And um, based on our conversations without even thinking about it, I, I referenced our child care businesses. And the, um, the NLC staff member gave us a shout out for thinking of them as businesses because they are businesses. Thank you. And, and I, so I think it's a good great approach. job. Yeah. <laughs> great so thank job. you very much. Yeah. I'm having some interesting NLC conversations as well around informal uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, so, yeah, great, great, great. Tacoma Park work <laughs> over at NLC. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, Council Member Smith. I first would like to thank you all for uh, the presentations today and dedication on this these topics. I think the uh, self-help eviction is just going to continue to become a problem. Uh, seeing it in some buildings. One thing that uh, is an issue is people that do qualify for assistance like through HOC are not actually filling out the applications, which is just another issue. Um, regarding the, the food distribution, I agree uh, with uh, Ms. Wiggins that we do need to um, pivot to SNAP uh, I have seen people hoarding the food that's distributed at the buildings. Um, they'll just try to take everything uh, rather than, um, you know, allowing their fellow uh, apartment uh, neighbors to also participate in the uh, food distribution. So that that's a, a big problem. Uh, Ms. Gaines, can you tell me what is the percentage of people that have been laid off that are actual Tacoma Park residents, or do you have that number? Um, oh, I don't have any. Um, I don't have any layoff numbers. Um, but we also the only number that we had going in was kind of the unemployment number. So not um, any kind of up to the minute Tacoma Park recent layoff in the last six months conversation. I can definitely extrapolate. Um, but Tacoma Park um, is uh, a really interesting bubble where uh, things will happen in a more severe way in Tacoma Park, even though folks don't see it that way. Um, and, you know, for example, we have really high, um, prior to the pandemic, we have really high unemployment, but we also have um, really high um, education, right? So we would have folks who have you know, dual degrees from universities in another country, and therefore they're underemployed. Right. So we, I don't have those numbers. Um, um, sorry about that, Council Member Smith. I can give you kind of the national view, and I can also work to see what we can extrapolate if you're looking for a direct percentage. 
Okay. That's, you know, I'm just concerned about making sure we help our own right now. You know, I mean, uh, I've just, I've just seen so many people that they don't know where to start, um, you know, with benefits running out or the feds not providing a, a lifeline for people. People are just, they're scared. They don't know where to yeah. go. They don't know what to do. Um, and, you know, I think we need to, I, I know the actual food distribution may not be the model, but we need to think about something if that stops, you know, yeah. because people are going to be hungry. You know, I, I see, you know, people just, they need something, you know. Um, so I do appreciate that. I know that homelessness is going to continue to tick up. Uh, you know, I, I know people are, are going to look for shelter along uh, Sligo Creek, the, the, the path. Uh, so I, I just hope that we just keep our eyes on it and we don't try to criminalize any of this behavior. We just try to help people. Um, these are going to be really tricky times for from November to January when the uh, new president is uh, in office. It's going to be really, really difficult for people. So, uh, so I applaud all y'all for the the work you're doing. This is this is really big stuff. Um, you know, I've talked to some of the business owners in Ward Five. They're not a lot of them, but you know, some of the the people I've talked to, they're pulling from their own savings to help their employees. I mean, you know, and they got money from the the federal government. But that that's that's small money when you're used to making thousands and thousands of dollars a month. When all that disappears or you know is severely uh, reduced, you don't want to put people on the street, right? So you know uh, maybe take a hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars money that you have in savings, and you know you pull that out and and you try to keep people going. That's that's happening. That's that's real. Uh, the, the more we can do to help, uh, and that's a service business. That's not a restaurant. Um, the restaurants, they're being killed. You know, I, I know they have opportunities, right? But all, if, if there's anything we can do, you know, a, a, a delivery service that's cheaper than Uber, um, you know, help them on the tech side. I mean, something, you know, I mean, just plain old uh, VoIP phone calls, you know, that can move messages around, you know, for, for people to place order orders, whatever it is, we, we need to really think outside the box to help these restaurants because, you know, I mean, people aren't just not going like they used to. And, uh, I went to a, a local restaurant, I think it was a week ago now. And, you know, there are plenty of tables open outside. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, whatever we can do as a city to help uh, our local businesses, our local families um, with not just food insecurity, rent insecurity, utility insecurity. I mean, it's just, I call it life insecurity right now. It is, it is really tough out there. So once again, thank you all for everything you're doing. I, I know it's really tough. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I have to be um, very candid with you that people aren't going to restaurants because they don't have money to go to a restaurant, right? So, you know, all of the issues are, you know, they're not just ours and they're complex. This is not economic development. This is community economic development. Mm -hmm. The piece of the community is the interconnectedness. And I do believe that, you know, for the first time, people start to see the interconnections um, when everybody has that same pull um, on their lives and their, you know, life security, as you um, just kind of mentioned, um, uh, Council Member Smith. So thank You're you exactly for that. Right. And yeah. we have been able to, as I said, we jumped in really early. So in the very least, we're talking to businesses that have never had a relationship with the city. Mm -hmm. So even hearing from us and knowing that, you know, having someone say, listen, if it all goes bad, mm -hmm. if you're, you know, you're at home and somebody, you know, someone is sick and you don't know what's next, you can call the city. Mm -hmm. Saying that to a resident is one thing, 
um, and expected in, you know, in some cases, but business owners were shocked and surprised and ever so grateful to hear that for the first time during one of the most critical times in their lives. What about PPE distribution? Is it still really difficult to buy bulk PPE? We've got, we've, that's a um, supply chain issue that's pretty much been solved. Okay. Um, now it's just the cost and we're covering costs um, for folks buying Good. PPE. Good. So uh, th- I will say that that is helpful um, around the safety piece. And you saw Jessica's kind of um, survey around the streetery and the fact that people feel safe and are safe. Folks are wearing their masks. Folks have masks. Um, that's something that we have, I'm not going to say it's solved, but we have come leaps and bounds. Um, and for the businesses, it's, it's a, it's a no brainer for the businesses. They can't even open without their masks. Right. Thank you. Council member Kovar. Thank you. And, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, one of the things that I noticed in the uh, pie charts and so on is that the um, more of the business assistance money has been spent than than the uh, resident assistance money, and I think it's understandable because the need was there perhaps more immediately for the businesses. But um, we did hear uh, um, from Ms. Wiggins that there is eviction activity taking place. Now, some of that has been put on hold by various national or, or, or other state and different types of policies, but with the courts coming back and the people self um, evicting, if that's the word, um, should we be spending more of that housing assistance money now to prevent that from happening? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you so much, Councilmember Kovar, because I do think that's something that um, we have been doing with MUST. Um, so for folks who had evictions that were pending prior to um, the pandemic, we've been paying off those balances. Um, our partner MUST has been doing that. And so the way these eviction cases work on failure to pay rent, it's what you owe as of a certain date. It's not the whole balance that stops the eviction. So in one case, we were able to put out $300 to stop an eviction. The landlord was gonna refile, but at least it stopped the most immediate issue. Um, and the idea was that, that, that those residents would then go to the county and get that $4,000 from the COVID-19 fund, because then they were in a category where they didn't have a summons. So- okay. I, find the, um, I thought the data showed that, or the presentation showed that most of the must the must money still hadn't been spent, but I thought you had said previously that most of it had. So where does that where does that stand? No, so you know must is stepping in. Um, well, let me say this: must doesn't become a factor in the county process until the the tenant needs more money than what the county can provide. Yeah. So must mm-hmm. works in that same building on Georgia Avenue, the Department of Health and Human Services. And um, so if let's, this is an example, if a tenant owes $6,000, they get 4,000 from the county and there's a gap to be filled uh, and they live in 20912, um, then the, the must will jump in with that money. How much of that money have, that we are doing with must has actually been spent? I guess that's what I'm trying to understand. So I can give you that number. Um, we actually just went through an invoicing process with them uh, I can give you the exact number. Um, it'll it'll be after this call. I can do it as early as tomorrow. I can tell you how much they've spent. But a lot of um, the money that's gone out, a lot of their money has gone to food. Uh, as I shared with the council, we have a relationship with St. Luke's. And so they're giving out um, gift cards to families on a consistent basis every but month. Do you feel like we need to do more than we're able to currently yeah. have evictions. That's what I'm now, about. So the trigger is the trigger is on the county side. And so, you know, we've been trying to help people in pockets where we know like the county may not help, where it's a delicate client that's got some undocumented status and they can't go through that process. It, the problem is nothing has really happened on the county level. Uh, and so they're trying to get through these applications from 311 
and they're not moving at a real pace. And so it leaves us kind of wonder, like we're in this anticipation mode um, it, for our, for, you know, for our department as well as for must wanting to jump in, but again, well, things are moving slower than we thought. Would it be beneficial for us to <laughs> contact our our elected official counterparts in the county yeah. and urge them to do something? Or so it. So I let me say yes and no. Yes, you can do that. No, I don't think it would make a difference. I mean, we're on weekly calls with the county uh, on this issue and they can't move any faster. The only, uh, I guess, the only carrot and stick on this is that they have to spend that money down by December 31st. And so I don't think they have enough staff to manage all of those calls that are coming in. They're putting people on waiting lists. So there's a lot going on. I. I would say call, I think, you know, working um, with Mayor Stewart, she's been incredibly involved in this. It's not anything that can be done by just one jurisdiction. It affects the whole county. Um, the other thing I will say, just so that the council is aware, many of our um, state funded housing um, property owners receive money from the Department of Housing and Community Development to help with an emergency assistance fund for those like specific buildings um, that get state funding through a low-income housing tax credit program. So there have been some emergency funds that have been created that have taken away the need for some of our buildings, um, which is really so good. I'll change, I wanna mention two more things. I know sure, it's getting late, but so are we hearing yet of people um, either in non-federally backed mortgages running into trouble or homeowners having trouble with property taxes? Nope. That you're just we haven't not... heard from any. It's interesting, we haven't heard, but then as I shared with the council before, the forbearance period, 365 yeah. months, and that started in March. So we hope, we hope that if there is a need, we're gonna begin to see that in the first quarter of 2021. Because you know, to be a homeowner means that you have you know a lot more protection over um, your housing uh, than a renter. So we haven't so, seen that at all. Last thing, I'll, I'll send in other questions, but um, I know other people want to speak. When we have two more agenda items, but for the FEMA and CARES reimbursements, and I don't know if this is more Jessica or or Samir or, or Susie or or yourself, Grace or whoever, but is that, I mean, is there a feeling that, that that's not going as well as it should be? And is that something that, that the council could be helpful on? I don't know who can answer that. <laughs> well, I, I can jump in a little bit. I mean, I, I, I would say that uh, Jessica and Ron have been working it from the staff side, uh, absolutely trying to make sure that, you know, we're given what they need. We were number three in the CARES list of getting our out of getting our reimbursement in. That was a long time. When did we put the first one in, Jessica? I, that was like yeah, July. I mean yeah, July. I think. Yeah. So I mean, we we were right in there fast, and we've been talking about these things uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, the county wanted to set up a certain kind of an application form and that system and. Uh, you know, you compare it to, I'm, I'm just going to compare to Prince George's County, which identified the population of its municipalities, gave a prorated amount to the municipalities, and you just got the funds. And then you could figure out how you distributed it. Uh, that's not how the process has been designed in, in Montgomery County. And, it, and it's taken a really, really long time, and we're working it. I know that there's right now an enormous amount of pressure on the county executive to see that this thing move fast. And, and, you know, and obviously there is this deadline and so they do need to get the funds spent. Um, I think it's always useful to, in talking with county officials, whether it's county council or county staff or the county executive to, to remind them that we have our act together our application information is solid. Uh, we 
we've filled the, we've got the invoices and all of that data. And, you know, when, when we have a question about what's the duplication of on business assistance, they should know who they gave the business assistance to. Why do we have to come up with the list of the businesses? I, I mean, to me, it's a pretty basic thing. They should have a list. Um, so you can just, you know, tell them, look, Tacoma Park's got its act together. We'd like them to move on it. And, you know, we don't want to offend them, uh, but we do want it to move forward. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, and I'll just say that I, I think FEMA has been pickier than in previous disasters just because they have so much demand that they kind of have to be. So like there were some of the city attorney expenses that we hoped would be reimbursed that weren't because they've been pickier as we've gone on. Um, and so it has to really be preventative work. Um, so that, so yeah, FEMA has been pickier, I would say. Mm -hmm. And Jessica, you know, the, the great report you did over the summer that was really helpful with the county council, do you think we could uh, maybe update that um, to provide them? Because that was incredibly helpful when we had to make sure that municipalities were even mentioned in the appropriations. Um, and I know um, Council Member Hucker's office really appreciated that information and some of the other county council members. So I think it might be helpful to update that as yep. well. Um, yep. Yeah, and I'll just remind folks, we the county calls that I'm on with um, um, Earl Stoddard, who's the one who is um, overseeing this, um, it's not every week now, they moved them to every other week. Um, and Jessica's on these calls as well. Um, and we can promise you, we're hammering them. <laughs> Here we are. Uh, there's, and there's a, lot, and, uh, there's a lot of activity. I don't mean to imply that there isn't. I just yeah. wonder whether others of us should be enlisted at times in it. That's all. That's all. Yeah. And I think when we've been, you know, I, I think right when, when we, we needed to helping recruit like the mayors of uh, Gaithersburg and Rockville and Jessica's working closely with their staff. Um, has been really, really beneficial. Um, and it's been noticed by the county exec's office and the county council, so. All right, thank you. Um, council Member Siemens. <laughs> thank you, and I, <clears throat> um, first of all, I wanna thank the three of you for being here with us at this late hour. I really appreciate <laughs> the, uh, the fact that you hung in there and you all, Uh, happy, so that's great. Um, anyways, I, uh, I also want to thank you, uh, Grace and, and Samira, for all the work that you've done and what you've described here tonight and uh, for the many hours and uh, hard work that you put in. And I mean, uh, the community should know that you, you are here uh, working and doing this stuff with a passion for the people. And um, and it's um, it's really appreciated. You know, I, it's really needed and it's really appreciated. Um, it says here my computer says that uh, my resources are low and, and my audio might be bad. I hope it's not. Um, anyways, the um, I. Ms. Wiggins uh, mentioned a, uh, an issue that uh, is maybe not so bad right now, and that is that uh, um, kind of the better we do uh, for people who are in d desperate need, um, the more people that we're going to attract. And uh, we may see a little bit of that now, but that's something I think we have to keep in mind and consider as we go forward, because um, I think some people have seen that, uh, and maybe Portland, Oregon would be one place where, um, you know, with the homeless population kind of migrated there when they found that there were great services there uh, for the homeless. And so I would like to think that we end up with great services. Uh, we're doing our best right now, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to provide more for people, but we're going to have to think about how we. Um, put some breaks on people coming here for that great service. 
anyways, as I listen to you all uh, and listen to, to my colleagues on the council tonight, you know, we're all sitting here in our, in our nice warm little homes and um, uh, yet there's, uh, there's people who are in the need right now. And I, um, <clears throat> I feel a sense of urgency that uh, with all the great work that's going on right now in the city on dealing with these issues, um, it's, it's fantastic, but I think we need a, a bigger plan. I think we need uh, uh, to articulate that bigger plan. There may be plans in people's heads, but I, I think there's uh, some missing pieces. And again, Ms. Wiggins, and, and, um, and I pick her out because of what she mentioned in her presentation, uh, but Ms. Cook Gaines is really talking about people too. She talks about businesses, but she's really talking about the people. And so, you know, we need, um, from what I heard from Ms. Wiggins, we need to understand what is the nature of the problem and how big is this problem so that we know what it is that we need. And I wonder if that isn't something where the council could be helpful in um, putting the money on the table to do a survey and not have Ms. Wiggins and Ms. Gaines Cook going out there to do the work for this, but uh, having, um, if necessary, a contractor to do the survey to find out what it is that we need um, so that we can target that need rather than uh, just react to the uh, uh, to the fire that's going on and popping up all over the place. So I would like to suggest to my colleagues that we consider as a as a uh, a last thing for this council uh, next week putting some money in for a um, for a survey on uh, on community need and and will give us seven days to come up with the, exactly what it is that we want from that survey. That's all I had to say. It's late at night. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 um, I like the way you're thinking, Council Member Siemens. I, the one thing I will say, um, and you know this because um, you're in the trenches, um, and I know that, and I respect that. The one thing that I've learned um, in this job in the short time I've been here, is that it's a really complex place. Um, takes a, some time to figure out what the city's about, who's in our city, and what those needs look like. Um, and so, you know, I welcome anything that the council would like to talk about with respect to that. But I also know it's taken Samira and I and, and other staff so much time to build trust. Um, and to build partnerships and relationships. And um, I think, you know, I, I used to say to Samira, I just need something to catch, right? Because um, if it just caught on, I think we could help many more people because they could trust us. And the things that we're dealing with, um, it, I think I may have mentioned this before, it, it's about being in the worst place of your life and being ashamed of who you are and not having you know the ability to look at yourself in the mirror and figure out who you are um, as compared to what you were before the pandemic and many of our families are struggling and calling out of desperation the one the one stat that i would share with you all is that we're probably getting about 20 to 25 unique individuals that are calling us every day. Um, and from those 20 to 25 people a day, there are about five or six touches that we have with them. There's an initial contact, and then there are probably four or five other touches that we have with them. And that may not result in um, the resolution. It may move them down the road, um, but there's a reason why they're calling. Many people say, so-and-so told me to call. And they're talking about some really deep things. So I would love for outsiders to come in, not to say that that's bad, but I also want to make sure that we understand what we're looking for um, and really have a focus on what that, what those needs really are, because there are a lot of them. Uh, 
you know, like every day it's like, well, we need to get into a new business. Um, and it's not just about social services. Um, I, mean, I didn't mean to suggest that you shouldn't be involved. Uh, you certainly <laughs> have the knowledge okay. and contacts that uh, could make it work. But I also think that uh, if someone were uh, to have that as, as a task, um, they could help the people who are willing, who have kind of come out of the, uh, the woodwork, if you will, and, and talking about their issues, that um, they can help uh, to spread the word to other people that uh, you know, these conversations are fruitful and uh, the more people that get together and talking, um, the more support people feel um, you know, from the community and also the more that we know what the community needs. So again, I, uh, I'm not saying it's a, you know, it's a cure-all and it certainly isn't intended to uh, take anything away from you guys because you're doing a fantastic job. But uh, I, again, like I said, I don't feel, I feel a sense of urgency that I don't see um, that, that we're doing as much as we could. And I think that's, from my perspective, that's the next step of uh, where I would put resources to, uh, to move this uh, along a little bit faster. Winter's coming. I mean, you know, it's not a warm night to be out there tonight. And, um, uh, you know. So um, Council Member Siemens, I will say there have been three business surveys completed, one by each of the business associations. Um, you will see their final reports. They're still pulling those together nicely. It's the reason why we can tell you how many people have received or have not received county support. Um, additionally, all of our grants have a reporting, i.e. survey component to them. So the stats that you will receive back on our first Many grants, which I uh, mentioned, we have about 35% of them in. We have very clearly asked them what they need. Um, so I will be able to get that information to you. Um, I'll also say, um, just to emphasize what Grace mentioned, um, change happens at the speed of trust. A survey goes nowhere if they don't trust where it's coming from, if they don't believe that it's gonna actually have an impact. It's just another need from someone else that they have to fill. Um, so I do really um, think that the quality of the questions and answers, et cetera, that have come from the organizations that the businesses have trusted the most being, um, our business associations, and then who are newly trusting the city. And they're newly trusting us because they're talking to us repeatedly. We're holding hands. We're having those hard conversations. We're also giving them actual cash in hand assistance. We are making a very serious difference. And we're not asking them to, you know, do the the county application dance, right? So I will say that this change that, um, and this information that you're seeking through something like a survey, I think it, be, it can be helpful. Um, but I do think that the trust factor is probably the thing that um, puts a governor on how, um, how much information we can actually get. I want right. to lean on the racial equity piece here because you can all, you know, surveys are things that are kind of, you know, you, you volunteer to take a survey. When you've been given a grant, it is mandatory that you report. So we have mandatory connections to those questions and answers. Um, in addition to, again, speeding up that, that, that trust factor because we are responding. So I hope that um, the more information that we get, I will be very diligent about getting that information out. So you can also see that we are operating in the spaces of need um, and not just doing a lot of stuff or putting out fires, but strategically operating in the spaces of need. 
I don't disagree with anything that either of you have said. Um, I just, uh, I think we need to move faster and not saying that you need to do the same thing you're doing now, do it faster, but get some help to, uh, to understand the problem better. Thank you. Um, Councilman Dabali, you had another question? Well, I didn't have another question. I just wanted to... Um, oh, sorry, I lost track of who's talked already. Yeah. Uh, well, and I, I'm not sure I have a question. I, I, the, the needs are so huge and the responses are so complex and it keeps changing. And I am just so impressed with how you you and your staff have responded and and worked both strategically and on this one-on-one -on -one level of trust with individual residents, with individual business owners. Um, I sense the urgency also, and I I wonder if it several several of us have said similar things to you in different words. What is it? that we can do to help you? What do you need, if anything, um, from us? Um, council Member Kovar said it uh, in, in different words and, and, and Council Member Siemens just asked about a survey. There's, there's this sense that you have so much going on at so many different levels of, of complexity that surely you must need some something to help with the, with the strategy, with the problem, uh, identification and maybe you don't because it looks like you're doing a great job um, but I think that's what we're all trying to say um, is what can we do to help you get ahead of this to the degree that's even possible and so I was I would be looking forward to the next time you come talk to us um, on eviction and on food in particular and on the and on relationship with the county especially financial relationship with the county um, where where you're at with those and what we can do to help you. And if that's next week because you want to work with this group, great. If it's a couple months from now, that's great too. But that sense of how can we help you get ahead of this if there is any way to do that. Um, and thank I'm you so much. If I'm, yeah, if thank I you so much. That. Hang on just a second. I, did I lose the sorry. video? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, my battery's running out too here. Um, so, so um, thank you, thank you so much for what you're doing, all of, all of you, and um, for the for the tracking on the on the expenses and reimbursements and the overall uh, strategic leadership, Jessica. Thank you also. Um, I'm done, and I'm going to go thank find a plug. So, so one of the things you you I know there's a lot of desire to help. Yeah, um, I've mentioned before the HCD director. One of the things that these folks are doing is also having to spend their time on <clears throat> some of the logistics of processing stuff and contract stuff and, uh, you know, oversight of timesheets and other kinds of things that are administrative that so they're they're trying to do the work and then they're trying to manage the big picture and they're trying to do these things and they're all very good at those big pictures. But part of the reason that I've asked for some help is, is to take some of that load and burden off of them. I mean, one of the things that's really frustrating is, you know, everybody wants the numbers, everybody wants the details, but you have to stop and get it. <laughs> and you're, you're trying to help the family here and yet we're like, well, but we need to report to council member so-and-so's request on these numbers. And so, so part of this is, you know, how do we take some of that weight off? So I just, I, 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 want to, I wanted to explain a little bit about that. I think there's other things that are the small side of this. That's the making the sign, the doing the whatever too. So there's also the, 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 the logistical side of, making sure that the new information's on the website or that the counting mechanism or the surveys prepared or whatever um, is, are these other kinds of things that are 
people oriented that that need some help. So it's in some respects that frees up people to be able to do their really their their jobs and and their, and use their talents and um, sophisticated ways of looking things um, a little bit without being diverted to some of these other activities. And to that end, Sue, um, to that end around what our city manager is saying, um, my intern's last day was September 22nd. Um, Grace Jo is no longer with the Economic Development Division, so you have an Economic Development Division of one person. And, um, you know, as great as I look in a cape, I just don't have all of the superpowers that I need to get it all done. We are hiring again, but the really interesting thing about this moment was I had an intern that was ramped up just in time for a pandemic and to go completely virtual. I will now be managing from the start a virtual intern. So I will say that there are some needs. Um, Susie, you hit the nail right on the head with the conversation about making a sign or scheduling these meetings and all of those kind of um, teeny tiny details that will actually take an entire two days for me because there's so much of them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's two days without email, that's two days without phone calls, that's two days without being in the field to visit someone. Um, we will, with a person, be able to deal with some of that and um, depending on the um, experience level, and hopefully, just like the intern we just had, we'll have someone who can take on so much more that I'm free enough to do something like establish a, you know, from ground zero grant program that's been more effective than the county. Um, that's, I mean, that's an amazing feat. And I don't see that as something that I did. I, saw, I see that as something that we did, that our team did. And that team includes our finance department, you know? So it really is the human capital and that's where our biggest need is. Um, it's not the information. It's not that we don't know who needs and where they need. We actually, um, it's the execution. So how do we go faster? We go faster and farther with a bigger, stronger team. And that's from the economic development division of one. So I'm not going to speak for Grace, who has a, a few more team members, but I'll even say that her issues are so much more complex because I get to at least collapse issues around the conversations of economic advancement, wealth creation, business development. Um, Grace, you know... Uh, She's a elastic program, whereas my boundaries are a little a little more um, standard. So I don't know if that means there's a proposal for a couple more interns or administrative help. I was actually thinking about bringing that up before when the HCD director came up, but I maybe this is a better time to bring that kind of thing up. So. so well, yeah. Councilmember so Dabala, I'm also very good with my consultants. I've been able to do amazing oh, yeah. work with the consultants. So again, you know, if you guys wonder how I'm spending money so fast, it's because <laughs> I'm spending it for more work, right? I'm spending it on consultants. That's how we're going to answer some of our technical assistance issues. Um, and I do think an HCD director will be able to take a lot of that weight, um, a lot of that weight off that, again, some things take days that you would not believe. Um, and I have to say, this is the first time in my career in over, in over a decade that I didn't have a special assistant dedicated just to what I'm doing. So it really, you know, it really does have an effect on um, how fast you can get things done. Okay, I think that's good. Thank you so much for your presentation um, this evening. Um, and um, Council Member Siemens, if you want to propose something, please get it to the rest of the council by the end of the week so we can get it up on the website um, and um, put together for the agenda packet next week. Close the business tonight, right? Yep. No, no. <laughs>
Yep, actually, well, you got two minutes, so. Um, great, well, thank you so much uh, to the WC manager, to our economic development manager, and Grace, I'm sorry, I never quite, like, I just wanna give you like the all, all over title. <laughs> It's just grace. So thank you so much. Thank you for having us tonight. This was really a pleasure and we hope thank to. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and your questions and your questions and, um, you know, prodding actually, you know, help us do the work um, in, in a better way. So thank you for that as well. Great. Um, thank you. And I, and I do want to say, I know we've asked you a lot of questions today, um, but being on these calls with the county and also being on the was it every other week call that me and Beto Rodriguez holds with businesses and restaurants? We are constantly being asked and held up as a model, particularly, you know, with the work, um, Samira, that you're doing. I think I had to miss like one of the calls last week and Maria Bertha was like, I need somebody. <laughs> somebody has to be on the call because we, you know, every, the rest of the county wants to hear from what Tacoma Park is doing. And so thank you for all your work. We really appreciate it. Um, great, um, tree commission appointments. Um, Council member Siemens, are you ready to go? <laughs> we can't hear you. There, is that better? I've been waiting for this. Thank you. Uh, the tree commission, uh, we, Short, uh, short on this, I hope. Uh, there are two people on the tree commission now, Nancy Cohen from Ward 1 and Car uh, Carol Hutton from Ward 3. And the city attorney tells us that we have to have at least three people on the commission for it to operate. You'll recall that it is a uh, quasi-judicial organization. And um, so uh, we have received several applications um, and I think each of you did get those applications to look at. Uh, James Woodwork from uh, Ward 2, Bart Seard, Ward 3, uh, Kristen Mueller from uh, Ward 3, and Paul O'Brien from Ward 5. Uh, we are going to be uh, making a decision on who to appoint to the Tree Commission uh, next week, I believe. And uh, so please uh, voice your concerns and ideas. Uh, there are actually, I think, two questions. One is, do we do want to just appoint uh, uh, one more person so that we meet the, uh, the minimum requirement? Or do we want to appoint more? Uh, I think at this point, um, we may want to uh, think about our work on uh, racial uh, equity. And, um, and go with just the minimum uh, addition at this point in time. So anyways, there it is. We can talk about it tonight or you can bring your great ideas uh, through email during the week so that the staff can- No, you can do that. That's already, you can, that's, that's like a uh, violation of means, Ross. Yes, same no, here. It's no, it's not. You can yeah. communicate by email. You just can't do it as a group. Uh, oh, that's true. You're right. <laughs> I guess, but still. We're... Oh no, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't do that. If you're all on the same topic, even if it's separate, it, it functions as a violation. So we really need to have a different kind of discussion. I, I'll, I'll, I can start. I would propose moving forward with, um, God, I can't read my handwriting. Um, Bart Sheard and James Woodworth. Um, uh, I, I would say that I, I ag agree with council member Siemens in how we're looking at the diversity, but it makes me worried just appointing one person to one of our um, quasi judicial committees that um, may need to hear a case given we are living in a time of a pandemic um, and um, with elections coming up and then the council not being in session in December and other things. So um, I would put forward that we um, ask Mr. Woodworth, who has forestry experience, um, and um, Mr. Sheard, who I just wrote lawyered next to his name, <laughs> um, uh, but I think he's a newer resident. Um, I think this is who Councilman Kostick had been talking to. Um, and so I would, 
I would propose to have both of them appointed. Councilman Costic, sorry, I forgot I was calling. Sorry. No problem. Um, I, I that sounds like a good approach to me. I would support that. My only question is whether there's any reason why we don't want to have an even number on the um, commission in terms of, of voting or, or decisions. I think an isn't. I think an odd number is better. Well, that's what I was thinking, but then we would have four. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Yeah. I can't do math tonight. Um, <laughs> so the other person I was going to, if we do three, is Paul O'Brien, because he does live in Ward 5, and we have we wouldn't have, we would have representatives from one and three, um, and Paul O'Brien is from Ward 5, if, but I didn't know if people wanted to do three three people. But that's a good point about having an even number. Um, all right, I got Councilman Dabala and Kovar. I was thinking the two that you named also, um, and I'm wondering if uh, there's, if Skip has an opinion about whether four versus five, because if we add another person, then we're once again, filling up with what's available and not um, not leaving space for uh, for recruiting a, a different types of people. And my other question is, um, would these be then appointments just till June 30th? That could then be renewed if that's the 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 sense of 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 the group. So these are these are temporary appointments, I, I think, which which might help with this question of locking ourselves in, or not of not locking ourselves in. I'm trying to remember when we passed it. Did for the quasi judicial? Yes, it did. Okay. So I was like, what, seriously, you paid a lot of attention to that. <laughs> So what we passed was that um, we suspended all appointments, any except for um, at our discretion, the appointments would all be temporary in nature, and we can make the appointments based on you know needs of the committee as well as to increase diversity. Just to note that I, we, we didn't receive any comments from the city attorney that it needed to be an odd number. So I, I actually don't think that needs to be your, your highest choice. I do think the discussions that the council had before really were related to having enough to be able to function as a committee, which in this case is three, and, and to try to meet the race diversity issues that you've raised. Councilman McCullough? I just say number one, uh, when we last checked, <clears throat> excuse me, when we last checked, there weren't any pending cases. So I don't think it's unbelievably urgent, but I, I definitely wouldn't support appointing three people because that just goes against what we're saying we want to do, which is to take the time to get a diverse group. I might support the two, but I wouldn't support three. And I'd be okay waiting too, since there's no pending cases. I would not. Well, I would. I would strongly recommend we not wait because we have an election coming up, and then we're on recess, or whatever the body is is on recess for December, and a case could come up, and we only have two tree com members of our tree commission right now. So and I, I just don't. I'd be adamantly against going with three right now, based on. All right, you, I, I, we hear that. <laughs> But I think I would be adamantly against setting us up for and putting residents um, without having a recourse um, in our city. And so um, I think waiting is not a good option. It would be irresponsible of us um, to do I that. Agree. At the moment, we do not have a functioning tree commission. Um, so um, we, how about next week we bring forward appointing James Woodworth and Bart Sheard and people can look at their applications again and decide for next week if they want to appoint one or both of them. But it sounds like we have at least agreement on 
<clears throat> those are the potentially the two, and some people may just want one. That sound good? And I'll just say for the record that Paul is not in Ward 5, he's in Ward 4. Oh, sorry. I thought his application said Ward 5. Thanks. It's sorry in Ward that. 5, but he's, in, he's on Mississippi Avenue. Oh. Okay. It's not in Ward 5. No, you're right. Hmm. Well, then we don't want him now. <laughs> so we go with that. All right. Um, election update. All right. Well, um, I, I have good news and bad news. Um, only that the, the good news is no ballots have been lost because they are not in the mail yet. Um, that the the most recent news I've received is that the ballots should arrive in Gaithersburg tomorrow. That, so the first ballot mailing will happen tomorrow. And what I'm not 100% sure of at this point is when, how long it takes once they hit that post office to reach um, residents. So I think it's a short amount of time, but I, I don't want to say for sure that people will have them Friday or Saturday, if I don't know that that's true at this point. So we will, um, I will certainly send an email to council and we will publicize the information when we know it. There is also a letter that was to go out last week that was delayed that should be hitting people's mailboxes tomorrow that tells them that their ballot is coming. So Th there will be so people should be receiving that tomorrow if not i mean possibly friday but i think tomorrow a lot of people will get that letter I, and that's the update that i have okay um can i think as soon as you know because i know last week when you said and i think it's in the newsletter that if people re don't receive their ballots by this friday um yep. so you might be getting a lot of phone calls <laughs> and i, I am <laughs> Um, I, we will deal with that. Yes. Yeah. Because I, I think that's a question that I, I know a lot of us have been asked. And yes, we've been selling folks if they don't get it by this Friday. To, so, yeah. Um, right. And the other thing, too, is just uh, people are, you know, with the federal election and everything else. There's a lot of confusion. So can you just review if you remember we could do this next week? Um exactly how we're dealing with our results, the process, um, just like people are starting to focus more on sure. our election and they're just sort of like, so are we going to know? Like, when are we going to know? How is it working? Like, so if we could just review that for folks. It, absolutely. Yes. Am I able to ask a question? I know it's late. Um, why are they being mailed in Gaithersburg? Oh, well, they're not coming from us. They're, they're coming from the printer. And so they drop, Gaithersburg is the, it's a central mail facility for, for this region. So they, they start in Gaithersburg to then go through the system to be then distributed to the local post offices. We don't, like to, we couldn't take them to Tacoma Park because they have to go through a sorting that happens not at that facility. It happens at a bigger facility. Yeah. Well, For that's, example, that's, our, new, our newsletter every our newsletter every month comes from Gaithersburg. Everything goes through Gaithersburg. Yeah. Okay. That's where when we that's, talk about the mail sorters and things like that, mm -hmm. that's where that sort of thing happens. Mm -hmm. And and I um, I also agree that I've been getting lots of questions about what happens election night, what happens the day after, how do they get counted? What you know, how long is it going to take? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you have a, a short, a thirty second explanation of what yeah. you're going to do election night that you could share with us right now, or do you not want to? Yeah, you know, I I could tell you what um, what we anticipate, and that is that on Monday we will be scanning the ballots that we've received that the Monday before election day, we will be processing and scanning ballots we've received, not tabulating, but scanning 
and then may or may not add in what happens on election day. So election night, we will at a minimum have be able to report the results from Monday back. So, so that ballots that have been received by Monday. What it depends on what happens on election day as to what else can happen, whether there'll be scanning on election day itself. That's what we're not. Um, it depends on how many people vote early and how many people show up on election day to actually vote. So the process is not the way it's been in the past where literally you're counting paper ballots in front of a crowd. Well, no, no crowd, but yeah, no crowds. Um, right. But, but you're not doing it that way either. The, okay. I think I might've missed that part. Yeah. So, right. So we are, um, the ballots will be scanned. So they'll be processed. Um, we, we scan the barcodes on the envelopes to note that they've been received. And then we'll be able to report whose ballots have been received and, and what has not come in yet. Then the ballots, after they're opened and separated from the, uh, the ballot envelope, then the ballots are unfolded, prepared for scanning, and then they're put through a scanner. And we'll, we'll do all this on video, so it, it will be a public process, so at, at a minimum there will be video of the process. And Jesse, if you can just note, so you didn't mention about those um, ballots that you'll receive that may have been mailed and, and arrived after election day. Well, right, so the process will continue. Uh, we will, so we, we are hoping that the bulk of ballots will come in by Monday, but there's election day and then anything that was mailed on election day or prior to that, we will continue to count up until the fifth day after the election. So if ballots are mailed on or before election day, they could be counted up until um, Tuesday. It may even be Wednesday. So it's five days after the election. I think it's Tuesday. So they will be, the process will continue every day. And we can report, we'll, we'll pull reports every day of the new totals. I think it's highly likely that the vast majority will come in by Monday, just based on what, what I'm hearing. So we could have a pretty good indicator by then. That is our hope, but we've never done this before. We don't, it's been a learning experience for sure. Great. Any other questions on the elections? All right. I think we're done. All right. Um, next week, um, as I said, the um, resolutions regarding personnel matters are already up on the um, website. Um, again, this is our last meeting um, before the election. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll see you all then. Thank you. Have a good night or morning. Good night. Whatever it is. <laughs> See ya.